participar desse vácuo. Welcome, Dr. Rajpal. Thanks for joining. Thanks for sparing time. Very good evening, everyone. I, Dr. Shivakumar from Menakshi Mission Hospital, Temple City, Madurai, India, take great pleasure to welcome you all to an academic feast, 3D, define the lesion, design the preparation, and deliver the results. An in-depth and comprehensive interventional cardiology virtual meeting. We have an engaging and stimulating program that will focus on acute coronary syndrome, bifurcation, calcium, stent failure, ectatic lesions, and CTO. Each day, we have three sessions focusing on various subsets like live cases, learn from master's session, and a keynote lecture by eminent international and national faculties. For the first time, we are collaborating with a joint interventional meeting, Gym 2021, and sponsoring a session where we shall be having a live case and two talks focused on bifurcation. 10 expert strategies by various experts discussing their experiences and learning of simple case becoming complex and complex case was made easy by latest technologies like OCT and physiology. Over 200 minutes of learning is scheduled here. I take this opportunity to extend my warm welcome to our national and international faculty for the day. They don't need specific introduction as they are the doyens in their respective field. Dr. Robert Wanguns, Dr. Stripal Bangalore, and my respected teachers and my seniors, Dr. Matthew Samir, Dr. Ajit Mulasari, and Dr. M.S. Hiramat, and all my fellow inter interventional cardiologists of India and people joining across the globe. Today, being the first day, our focus would be on various approaches towards the management of bifurcation, multiversal disease, and stent failure. We'll be starting the day with a let's discussion session where we shall be focusing which one is critical, how do I manage and get long-term better outcomes after index procedure, Ostil LAD or Ostil LCX. After that, we'll be moving on to a live case from MIMS Calicut on multivessel PCI or acid coronary syndrome. Then followed by a learn from master session from Robert Wanguns. After that, we shall be moving to our next session focusing on stent failure where there will be a discussion on classification and causes of stent failure by Dr. N.K. Mahesh, and Dr. Sripal Bangalore will be sharing his experiences. After two exciting sessions and a live case, we shall then be moving to Italy for a joint session at gym 2021. For the first time, we shall be sponsoring a session at gym. The session is focused on bifurcation. We shall be having a live case from Apollo Hospitals, Chennai. Dr. Matthew Samuel, the legend, will be doing the live case. Dr. Sangat Velu and Dr. Deepak Davidson shall be delivering their talks on side branch closure and unplanned bifurcation in SCS scenario. And Dr. Antonio Colombo from Milan, Italy, and Dr. Azim Latib from New York, USA, shall be moderating the session. Without much ado, I hereby start the conference with Let's Discussion session. The session is focused on discussing which one is critical, how do I manage and get long-term better results. Ask your lady how I deal, ask your LCX how I deal. We have three great experts here today with us. Dr. Elilan from Triple M Chennai, 
Dr. Rajpal K. Abhichand from Kaimatur and Dr. Ganesan from MMHRC Madurai. And speakers for today are Harish Mehta for Austin Lady Hawaii Deal and Dr. Sanjeev Rai from Jaipur, Austin LCX Hawaii Deal. I request Dr. Harish Mehta to deliver his talk before I give this topic to all the three experts to take their perspectives and move on to the speakers. Right. Dr. Harish. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Shiva, for having me in this good meeting. You are really a good friend of mine, and I always cannot say no to you. I'll just start saving, uh, sharing my screen. Okay. So my approach to Austral LED, we all know that Perkitin's intervention to LED Austral region always can pose unique challenges and is associated with high restenosis rates and medium-term complication. It is traditionally defined as a lesion arising within three millimeters of the vessel origin, and a decision should be made at the outset as to the precise position of the stent at the ostium is attempted, or whether the stent should cross across the L6 X back into the left main. Presence or absence of a nub or a stump decides whether you can facilitate proximal positioning. The angle with the LCX also decides if it is less than 75 degrees, will you be able to properly deploy the stand? Will you have any struggle crossing over if uh, you do not get the ostium right and whether you'll end up with a crush in case you miss the ostium? So precise already ostial pacing, it is necessary to radiate the stand, should be within the radio opaque marker of the stand balloon and the proximal marker must be positioned proximal to the ostial area. The important thing here is that you should get a right view for that. If you do not get the right view, you may end up a couple of struts into left main or you may end up uh, ahead of the ostium. And the second issue with this is if you end up with a couple of struts in the left main and you realize that your circuit is in trouble, then you may end up uh, doing a crush or a mini a crush to the LED stand, which will affect your base rates. So this is the approach that uh, has been recommended all over. Uh, I won't go into detail of this. Everybody knows about this provisional side branch stenting versus uh, two branch stenting, depending on the lesion, the size of the lesion, the dominance of the vessel. And these are the factors which favors the provisional approach or favors the two stent. The, I'll just discuss the provisional approach. If it's insignificant stenosis of the osteal circumflex, small circumflex, diminutive circumflex, wide angle between the lady and circumflex, and no concomitant disease or only focal disease in the LCX. Once you've done the provisional stenting, then you have the option of whether you want to open the side branch strut to facilitate the uh, opening of the circumflex. Do you want to do pot side pot or you want to do a pot key spot that has lots of uh, pros and cons. We won't go into detail of that. Or if you end up with a bad circumflex, then you can convert it into T or a tap or a culotte depending on they have entered the proximal cell or the distal cell. Ideal cell to enter is the distal cell. And I'm going to now take you through the cases. Uh, so this is an 84-year-old 84 male. He refused surgical intervention, developed first degree AV block with LBBB, intermittent CHB on DDDR pacemaker. This is the angiogram where you can clearly see an osteal lesion with probably a distal left main lesion and a circumplex one more lesion. Uh, the debate here would be key. we should ideally do a two-stent approach here, and the syntax score was 31. So we started with the rota link plus at 1,90,000 RPM, multiple runs with pecking technique. Then we did a flex tome 3.5 into 10, and we end up with the ever limits editing stent 3.5 into 20. Then we did the pot in the rewire using the reverse hook technique, followed by a pot again. Pot with a 4.58 NC balloon, Proximal LED with 3.5 into 8 NC balloon as distal optimization. And now if you look at it, this uh, we left like this because we thought ki this was not necessary to be stented. Of course, you can always argue that you can do an FFR and you could have decided whether you need to do a stent to this. And we have a follow-up on this patient and this patient is doing very well, asymptomatic completely, so we left it like this. Now, coming to the second uh, case presentation, 15 year old male ischemic heart disease, ACS, LVF 40%, type 1 diastolic dysfunction. So this has an occluded LED with an osteal lesion with a dominant circumflex. So by definition, again, this would uh, 
go in favor of maybe up front two stent strategy but the circ looked relatively disease free so we decided we are going to do a opening of the cto first with the gaia and the caravel and then we changed over and just to be sure we did an oct to decide the stent we are going to use the length of the stent we are going to use so this uh, was an oct run where you can see multiple cuts in the intima which has happened with the balloon we have used so this is a well prepared lesion so i want to run the whole oct image and then we did a distal led with an everolimus eluting stent 2.745 mid led with everolimus eluting stent 333 and then we did the left main led with the 3.524 followed by a pot 4.58 and again the, we saw this uh, vessel which looked pinched and one with nitroglycerin the circumflex looks good enough and we again left this with a single strand tragedy and when you see the oct tech back here we did the entire oct right from the entire strand length and this was the final result and if you see the outcome we've got we got an area of 7.51 10.07 at the confluence, 10.05 in the distal left main, and 15.95 in the austral left main. So we were clear that we didn't want to do anything further, and this patient again is doing well. Coming to my third presentation, it's a 70-year-old male, non-diabetic, non-hypertensive, non-smoker, developed chest pain on exertion, progressively increasing over the two months. EMT was positive inducible ischemia. The angio showed long segment LED lesion, beginning at the ostium, long ramus. So we thought whether we need to do anything to the ramus. In one view, it looked like it might be a significant ostial lesion. So we did the same. We put a wire in the LAD. We did a pre-dilatation again. I was run of ramus to evaluate the disease at the ostium, and we realized it was not too bad. We don't really need to address the ostium, and we went with again a provisional stent approach. Then we put a three to twenty-eight DS in the mid LED, and the three point five into twenty millimeter DS placed in LMC overlapping with the LED stand. Again, a pot, and this was the result. So we again ran an IVUS through it to show whether the ramus was compromised or not. I'll straight come to that position. If you see the ramus, it seems to be very patent. You'll see it coming now. we decided again so we left it alone if you see the ramus it sees very much open we left this alone and this is the final result so the only case where i feel that austral led can be stented is when you have a lesion like this where you have enough of a margin to put your stent right at the ostium this is probably the only lesion where i don't cross over into the circumflex and this was again uh, We put a DES three and post that to three point five. So this was the only lesion and only subset where I would recommend that you should uh, cross, not cross over to the circumflex because you have margin to place an osteal stent. Well, I'll hand it over to my friend Dr. Sanjeev Roy, and then we can come back and discuss the next part. Uh, that was a phenomenal cases, uh, Arish. I think, as you rightly said, we can quickly move on to Sanjeev. and then we can take the discussion together hope uh, elilan ganeshan and rajpal agree for the same yeah absolutely thanks elilan and ranjpal joining today Hi. and sparing time for us am i audible Yeah, not it. I think you are on mute. Um, your screen is seen, and you can make it on. Uh... No, no, he is. Yeah, he, he able Absolutely. to hear you. Yeah. Okay. Good evening, okay. and uh, uh, today, uh, Dr. Shiva has designed a very interesting session. 
uh, and you have heard Dr. Hirsch about uh, the austral uh, LED approach. Unfortunately, in the austral circumflex approach, there are a lot of paucity of data. And uh, if you just look at a minute on the left main anatomy, and if you look at here, on an average, the, the uh, divergence angle between the two branches, that is LED and austral, is on an average 70 to 80. And uh, it's very relevant because this is the largest uh, branch in the bifurcation diseases, which supplies nearly about 20 to 25 percent, depending on the dominance, and sometimes 30 to 40 percent, uh, depending on the dominance. So, what are the circumstances where left circumflex uh, osteal is stenosed? So, there could be a very osteal uh, uh, LCX stenosis, which is Medina 011. It could be both osteal LED and osteal circumflex lesion, which is 011. It could be a combination of left main with circumflex osteal, sparing the LED, that is 101. And finally, it is a pure bifurcation lesion, that is 111. So uh, Dr. Harish has covered uh, two of them. So I'll focus on the isolated left main stenosis and stenosis with the involvement of the left main. But if you look at the, uh, the involvement of the circumflex, this is a very old series from the ICPS. And if you look at in the series of 291 patients, this kind of 001 involvement is, was seen only in 2%, while 101 was seen in about, again, 2%. So it was mostly a pure bifurcation lesion, and the involvement of uh, circumflex was in, mostly in disangled digits. The stenting of circumflex has rheological consequences, hence, and hence impact on the outcome. So PCI of osteal LCX is contemplated when you have an acute coronary syndrome with a pure osteal L circumflex lesion. If it is a chronic stable uh, syndrome, uh, here again, I mean, uh, unless patient is symptomatic on maximal medication, we usually try to manage more conservatively. The other situation where you, uh, you involve the circumflex is during the uh, left main LED as a bailout strategy when your circumflex is involved. So assessment of L circumflex osteal disease is, should not always be purely based on angiography and physiology and imaging plays an important role. Let's look at the situation where isolated circumflex is involved. So what is important is we, might, we should be wiring both branches, but if one is confident that the LED is disease free and the angle is quite appropriate, can manage with one wire. The most important, if you have a lesion, it needs to be dilatation, uh, dilated and well prepared if need be uh, with atherectomy and other devices. Now, after dilatation, if there is, uh, you know, pre-dilation, there is no plaque shift to the LED or the left main. One can attempt for the LCX osteal stenting, but mind you, again, this kind of phenomena is similar to what Dr. Hirsch said, when you have a very, very wide angle, otherwise there is always a chance of encroaching into the, you know, protruding into the left main and this, there'll be a carina formed, which might in future uh, future time may impede the flow to the LED. So better it is for an inverted provisional with a pot where from the circumflex to the LED, uh, we can stand. And then after stenting, we look for again, if there isn't a plaque shift or not. If there is a plaque shift, again, and where you have, uh, you know, done only a the circostal stenting, we can convert into a crush or T stenting and go ahead with two stents if needed, if there is a suboptimal results. While if one has gone for the circumflex to uh, left main to circumflex stenting, we do a kissing balloon. If optimal result, we leave it there. If not, we can always go for a tap stenting uh, that is inverted tap to the LED. So let me take you to a couple of cases. This is an acute coronary syndrome case, 43 year old diabetic. And if you look at here, the, there's an absolutely isolated circumflex stenosis. So I wired both branches. Uh, normally I don't do, but uh, here the stability of the catheter was an issue. So I did it, I did a thrombosection. And after thrombosection, you can see the flow was a little bit better. And I went for a direct stenting because this was an acute coronary syndrome uh, with a three into 23 uh, Everlimus saluting stent. Positioning of the stent was a little bit crucial because we were not able to see the, uh, the osteal left main properly. And thereafter, it was a pot, a bifur uh, kissing balloon, and a repot. And these were the images that we have. We can look at the, the, uh, the LED ostea is quite wide open. Uh, so it gave an excellent result. Uh, 
on the the left main to uh, circumflex strategy and these were the final angiographic results let me to give uh, to a second case and this is a chronic stable angina patient there was a instant restenosis of a uh, circumflex stent again this was a stenting done for the um, for the uh, osteal circumflex involvement it was many many years back almost like 14 years back and now he has an involvement of both the left main and the circ osteo so again in this case uh, a, you know proper dilatation of the circumflex osteo was done and we did an oct in uh, view of the paucity of time i'll just skip over what we found that the led was not significantly involved so we went again with a left main to circumflex stenting more controlled status and this was the final result where you can see a nicely Uh, the the lumen nicely came out to be good well expanded stent and with sparing of the led which was nothing was done these were the final results so what happens to in the another situation where we have done a pre dilatation of the uh, vessel and you have a plaque shift to either the led or to the left main as well so either led or left main again in that situation we usually uh, you know uh, it should be always defined beyond angiography by imaging and physiology and this case we can go for an upfront uh, two stent strategy uh, either by a mini crush dk crush or a collard or if it isolated involvement of the led and left main osteal and it is sparing the left main which is if there is disproportionate in the sizing of the led and left main we can always go for a b stent but this is not a very preferred outcome because the neocarina is always a troublesome in this case so this is another lesion this was an led lesions done about 11 years back and we had a circ osteal involvement and again after preparation there was a left main to circ dilatation we crossed the led again and here on crossing led we profiled the previous stent was they had a late mal opposition Uh, if you can look here, there is a late mal opposition, so I thought I might just balloon dilated, and that was a kissing balloon and a dilatation of the center part, and a repot again, and with that you can see it is a well expanded stent from left main to circ, and this is how the angiographically it looked, and this is the last case again a chronic stable angina. Now this patient had undergone an uh, the LED osteal stenting. now he became symptomatic and there was a progressive angina and if you look at here there was a lot of haziness in the circ osteo so on interrogation this was we found that the actually led uh, stenting had started from the uh, left main and this is how it was endothelized it partitioned the left main osteo into two small uh, lesions and this is how the patient was symptomatic so we wired the Uh, the the stent why why the circumflex through the stent struts now again this we found that on the imaging it was the proximal strut so we again crossed it through the distal struts and after crossing the distal strut you can look at the curve that balloon is taking it was very difficult but we managed to get through the distal struts we dilated the struts and here because we deformed the struts which were starting from the left main to led so i thought it is better to go for a two stent strategy here and treated with the two stents this was a crush and after crush again two stents kissing dk crush this is first kissing this is the second stent deployed recrossed pot second kissing and this were the final results of this so these are a couple of examples that uh, i wanted to share with the involvement of the circumflex osteo yeah that was uh, fantastic uh, sanjeev uh, you clearly shown the downside of a single stent crossover of led tlm where you get multiple osteo which was proven in oct roni matthew has shown many times there's a famous statement by ashok said aiming the bull's eye missing the target that's what happens with osteo lesions when you try to target only at the osteo i hope i leave it to the uh, expert panels here to further take it on and we can come to a reasonable conclusion of what we want out of these two topics
राज्यपाल एलिलन एंड गणेशन Yeah, thank you, Swa sir. That was a great talk by Dr. Sanjeev and Dr. Karish. Um, just I would like to add a few points to the for the beginners. Uh, when to uh, do? There are three ways by which you can do the um, manage the osteal LAD disease. Uh, we all know that uh, crossover uh, stenting from left main to right is all uh, has a more data and more better prognosis mm -hmm. when, uh, rather than the osteal LAD stenting. And the second method is a floating stent technique, and third one will be the precise osseal position of stenting. So among the three, uh, it is always better to do a left main crossover uh, because it has a long, uh, better data outcome. Really, Len? Dr. Really, Len? Yeah, I, I also agree. Very difficult to precisely position the stent at the osteum or exactly at the osteum of. Yeah. Um, so we can always take the help of imaging. Imaging plays a very crucial role in the management of osteal LAD disease. I think my um, all the both the presenter will agree with me, and the other uh, expert panel will also agree with me. Uh, if you use the help of uh, whether IVS or OCT, definitely we can uh, exact. If we are able to rule out left main disease, then definitely we can precisely place the stent at the osteum of LAD, and you can achieve optimal result. Otherwise. Uh, if you see the long term data uh, available uh, if you uh, you are going to place a standard the osteum of a lady the um, tlr rate is around 8.3% so we should be always very careful and one more point to the beginner is for in acute coronary syndrome setup or any acute symptom if you have a osteal lady occlusion or osteoproximal lesion um, it is better to do a crossover left main stenting uh, rather than put a stent exact trying to put a stent exactly at the osteum because we may cause significant block shift uh, into the circumflex or into the left main and cause hemodynamic compromise. Perfect, Ganesh. Dr. Eli, yeah. Uh, yeah, I also agree. I mean, sometimes even the left main might look normal, but when you do an imaging, you will see definitely the part of the left main. So, only way after imaging, one should decide whether you want to place an osteal stent. Always, it is better to do a crossover from left main to LAD. Uh, I think with the imaging, one can optimize the LAD osteal stenting. That was perfect. Uh, Dr. Rajpal is around. Uh, before getting to Rajpal's opinion, uh, out of four cases shown by uh, Harish, uh, we clearly shown the advantage of uh, crossover in three cases, and uh, then the fourth case where he just uh, just juxta osteally landed, where he made it sure angiographically. I think you can take a call, um, not always, if you are very sure. I think that most of the time, angiographically, it is tough to take a call on that. Uh, basically, we want to, we don't want to have a, a missed disease at the distal LM or at the osteal LCX uh, in a so-called osteal LED lesion to come back with a patent LED, but disease looking uh, awkward at uh, the LCX osteum. That's a, a very reason we are here. Coming back to Sanjeev Roy's cases, uh, can we take, at the end of the day, can we take this discussion as LAD being a vessel where the myocardium at GFRD is great, even in a dominant LCX, majority of the myocardium is supplied by LAD. So single strand crossover and getting the LCX back is definitely a great idea because we want to keep the LAD long-term results always better. Whereas in LCX, as rightly said by Sanjeev Rai, that even in a dominant LCX, uh, it it serves only 10 percent of the 10 to 20 percent of the myocardium. Uh, how about in osteal LCX, uh, keeping it at uh, at the osteum uh, and uh, at, at at the cost of uh, not to uh, invite the disease uh, later on uh, into the LAD by doing a crossover from uh, LM to LCX. So at the end of the day, can we take it as if it is LAD osteum crossover? If it is LCX osteum, can we uh, restrict ourselves to the osteum itself? Just for the speakers as well as for the experts yeah. here. So Shiva, I have an interesting take on this. If you have an LCX osteum, because of the yeah. angle, it's very difficult to get into uh, right of the osteum of the circumflex unless the angle is good. Absolutely. So I would say if you're going to if you're going to go for an LCX osteum, I would go for an upfront two stand strategy. And right. look at uh, the LED more important unless uh, unless it's a infarcted LED. I would still look at. So the you LED mean to say infarcted. even in osteal LCX disease? I would look at it as a I would it as a still left main bifurcation. Still left main bifurcation, and you'll critically evaluate now distal LM as well as LED yes. 
and you will make sure that no no left no blocks left out somewhere yes. around those areas. Yes, because you are dealing Perfect. with Sanjib. the LED, you have to be better off. Right. Sanjib, you are a take on this. Yeah, can I can I share three more slides? Please Quick. go ahead. Okay. That's the very reason here we are. How we does we approach Austral LCX as a different animal, or we give the same importance as Austral LED is the question here. So we had this white paper of the EBC uh, bifurcation club uh, by Burzata. And actually, if you look at here in the match classification, the side branch, it describes what I just presented, either exclusive side branch or still stenting, or we could make it uh, right from the cross, uh, crossover stenting, like uh, the inverted crush. I'll come to the next slide. But here again, if you are encroaching too much into left main, it becomes again difficult and you have to be open for the... Uh, two stand strategy and you we don't have the capella side guard stand yet so other option is like just like here this is an inverted uh, um, strategy across the side branch across where you can always uh, you know uh, do it as a inverse uh, pot uh, crossover stenting so and this is again a study uh, which actually was some time back and now uh, this work paper uh, was published should be stent towards the largest vessel or the tightest lesion. And that's what exactly your point was when choosing between the, uh, the LED and the circumflex. And here, if you look at the statistic figures, when the tightest lesion was chosen, the stenting towards the, uh, the tightest well allowed a significant reduction in the number of stents with a trend towards lower event rate at the three years. While when you are doing for the largest vessel, it is not always the best strategy as it is associated with higher mace at three years time. So uh, on that note, I would say that we look for whenever actually LED osteal and the, the uh, disease is there and the circ osteal disease as well. So it is better always to approach the tightest lesion and be more conservative towards the other one. So this is overall I'm uh, saying. And with that view, I think uh, the exclusive osteal stenting is only good if angle is very good, just like the last case Dr. Harish uh, showed where you have a very wide divergence of the LED and circumflex. Otherwise, precise positioning is not possible. And I showed the uh, restenosis with the, uh, the cases that we had uh, an isolated uh, osteal stenting and we had to go for the crossover stenting. Once you are doing a crossover stenting, you are at more control and you have the, always the flexibility of, you know, going to a two stent strategy if need be, rather than, you know, struggling just to position it at the ostea, which never is actually truly osteal. It is always encroaches the left one. So I think Dr. Siva Kumar's internet is fluctuating. So Dr. Sanjeev, you can continue your discussion with the panel. Okay. So uh, I have an interesting scenario. I would want uh, all of you all to discuss this. Now we all know that the Achilles heel of uh, bifurcation has always been the osteal circumflex. And in a true bifurcation, if you have to do a DK crush with an equally sized vessel, or if you want to do collot, both the vessel size are equal. Which one will you make it as the main branch? Which one will you make it as a side branch? Or as a rule, you will make LED always as the main branch. Uh, see, if it is a very interesting question, and if it is both are equal sized, as you said, uh, but yes, uh, even with equal size, the area of myocardial supply of the LED is much larger, unless it is a left dominant, which might be 40, 60, 40 ratio, but otherwise, uh, you know, we consider the circumflex as a side branch and we should deal it uh, like a side branch. We should have the stent there, crush it, and then go for the left main LED. Having said that, we have also tried on when you have a very large circumflex and a little bit smaller cal caliber and inverted tap or uh, stuff like that. I mean, you have done from the left main to circumflex and then used the LED as a side branch. So, uh, we cannot be very dogmatic. I mean, it, uh, it, it depends on the situation. So we have to little bit customize according to the patient's anatomy and the actual size of the vessel dominance and all those things. I think uh, we cannot be uh, give a one-liner answer to that. It has to be absolutely based on the situation. 
So the question to both uh, Dr. Harish and uh, Dr. Sanjeev, sir. Do you recommend any special stents or any particular, uh, because we need a stent which a high radial force uh, for our seal stenting. Do you recommend, uh, to, do you prefer any uh, particular stents, sir? Very, very important point, uh, Dr. Ganeshan. And it's basically when you have, you look at the size of the, uh, the left man, and I think uh, with the imaging so readily have available, if any lab has an imaging, things become much easier where you can assess the size of left pain and the distal landing zone. And then according to the sizes and the you know uh, expansion capability of the stents, you can always use that and play around. So I think uh, imaging plays a very important role. And of course, when there is a lot of disparity, you look for the later generation stents, which has more wider expansion uh, capability than the, uh, the older generation stents. So choice of stents, yes, and platform, and also the side branch access, which is very important. Uh, what is the, you know, uh, the, the uh, maximum area that you get between the connectors and the struts uh, as an access? So let's say if you have a 3.5 stents, you are using it, the side branch access will be maximum 3.25 uh, to three. So as Dr. Harish was saying, if you have two uh, branches equal, I think in that case, you have to consider that whether you can expand the, the, the side branch to that uh, vessel size limits or not. That's also very important. I, I agree with you. I think we have two more minutes. So I will quickly take a uh, take home message from the topic, brief messages from speaker as well as from expert panelists. Start with Harish. Yeah. So I would say austral stand should always be taken as a left main lesion. You should treat it as a left main lesion. And I generally go with a provisional stent strategy unless you have a diffuse disease in the side branch. And you should know your stent characteristics and also the balloons available or caught on your shelf. Because if you do not bring your stent enough back into the left main, you may end up distorting or damaging the left main. So this is I, how I would approach my case of Australia lady. Perfect. Dr. Elena? Uh, Just one <clears throat> quick take yeah. home. Sometimes if the circumflex is uh, not too big, and the plug uh, volume also is not uh, too large. You can even consider just doing a cutting balloon of the LCX Austin and putting left main to LED stand. Uh, because anyway, the circuit is going to come back. So you can always delete that during the second. Dr. Sanjeev? Yeah, as uh, Dr. Elian said, I mean, uh, when it is a, a circumflex osteal lesion, and if you have a chronic stable angina subset, Intervention should be the last option. It's only when patient is symptomatic on maximal medication. And if it is a small vessel, then the challenges are much more. Uh, but given a choice, I mean, it, uh, the strategy will depend on a couple of factors, including the size of the vessel, the involvement of the LED and the left main. So although there are no outcome data, uh, but if uh, preferred approach would be going for left main to circumflex if uh, the, the anatomy is conducive. Otherwise, isolated osteal stenting if the angle is wide and one can expertise on the positioning. That was perfect. Can I say one quick brief? Uh, yeah, if you want to do precise osteal stenting, please go under the guidance of imaging. Imaging alone will help to differentiate whether there is any left main disease or not. Otherwise, uh, always do a left main to a lady crossover. That is always better. That was perfect. So the message out of the session today, out of these two topics are, the days are not like yesteryears. We have a wonderful tool called as imaging, whether it is OCT or IOS and physiology. So we know what to do, where the plot, where to land. So it, the days were not like angiographic based decisions to confuse within ourselves to regret later. So take the help of imaging as early as possible and go ahead with your image based decisions. Thank you one and all. Thanks for buying, being with us. All the expert panels, Elilan, Rajpal Abhichand, Ganesan, and speakers Harish Mehta and Sanjeev Rai. Thank you, Anandal. Be with us for all the two days. Let's move on to the next topic. Thank you very much to the panel, Elilan, Rajpal, Ganesan, for sharing their expert views. Now we'll move on to live case from Aster Mims Calicut. We have Dr. Shafiq Matumal, Dr. Salman Saludin and Dr. Anil Salim shall be doing a live case. I welcome the panel for the live case, Dr. Harish Mehta, who gave a talk for us now from Rahaja Hospital, Mumbai, and Dr. Madhu Sridharan from NIMS Hospital, Trivandrum. And by the time when live is on, Dr. Robert Wangun is also going to join us. Over to Aster Mims Calicut for the live case for the day.
Oh, no. They are getting ready. If you can continue your discussion with the panel, that will be fine. They will be joining us in one minute. Right. Perfect. Having landed from LM to LDD in a so called uh, non disease free LCX, how often when you don't address it? Generally, people, when there is a large vessel, wait to cross mm -hmm. the strut and open it for future intervention. Uh, okay. Because LM is big LCX. 1.5 mm. Have LM, you ever please? regretted the austral LCX looking uh, multiple ostia? Or uh, there is I a. I think let's do the first thing before. The, Ostium uh, looking ugly, uh, inviting thrombus. Have you come across those kind of situations where single strand crossover untouched LCX as it was looking Toxin normal? Yeah. Begin with, okay. as well as I need, with what I'll do is I'll pass option. the balloon, then take Parish a and clear strand. Then take uh, a clear strand. I think we can hear them from behind. Do you want to listen to them first? I can hear them from behind. They're still not live, but we can hear them. Oh, okay. right. right. Okay. If they are Good on evening. live, we can move on to that. We can't see them though. Yeah, yeah. Good evening, everyone. Am I audible? I'm Dr. Shafiq here from Astomims. Yeah, yes, Shafiq, you're audible here. How are you doing? I'm doing great. And we have a great panel for you, Dr. Harish, Dr. Madhu Sridharan. And you can um, start, you can go ahead with your case presentation and move on. But we are not Thank you. Uh, see, Sorry. We are not seeing your, we are seeing your uh, slide as you were hospital. Okay. But we are not seeing the lab and are you playing some videos and moving on? Yeah. Please let me know when the video is on. Yeah, perfect. The video is on. Yes, we are we are able to see uh, you all guys. Okay. And if somebody can start uh, explaining the case and uh, you can take us through the live. Okay. Uh, hi all. Uh, good evening. Welcome to Astomims Cardiology. And uh, first of all, I would like to thank Dr. Shiv Kumar for uh, giving us an opportunity to perform live in this prestigious uh, uh, interventional meeting. And um, we have a 77 years old gentleman who is uh, a plan for a, a left main bifurcation standing. Uh, with me, uh, uh, I have Dr. Anil Salim, my colleague, uh, Dr. Salman, my colleague, and scrub nurse, Dr. Atira, uh, and uh, uh, Justin, our chief technician, Mr. Mohan, with us. Uh, over to you, Dr. Salman, to explain perfect, the sir. case and details. All right, fantastic. Uh, a warm welcome to everybody. Very good evening to one and all present here. Again, for those of you who are not uh, from this part of the world, welcome to God's own country, uh, Ke Kerala, uh, the southernmost state of India. Right, so uh, uh, just to introduce our hospital, Astomims Calicut is one of the largest hospitals in this part of uh, the state, uh, a 600 bedded hospital. Ten. We do around uh, 4,000 procedures a year. Okay. And that's our hospital uh, bedded amongst very beautiful coconut trees there. Anyway, so getting back to our case. Uh, Go ahead. Next slide, please. Okay. Kissing so as uh, Dr. Shafiq mentioned, this was a guy, a 77-year-old gentleman uh, who had uh, a diabetic, who had an anterior wall STEMI, who presented with uh, pulmonary edema. Okay. And uh, he had uh, come to us in shock around uh, uh, 60, 70 systolic in uh, pulmonary edema. ECG showed a typical ST elevation changes in the anterior wall. And the uh, echo showed uh, moderate LV dysfunction. Right. So as you can all see, I hope it's uh, visible here. The patient was unstable at that point of time. We can see that the proximal LED is cut and a very sinister looking left main there. Uh, Medina 111 left main with an uh, proximal LED occlusion is what we can see here. Next slide, please. Yeah. So this is the cranial view showing the same and the right coronary. The right coronary was uh, pretty robust there and we didn't have much of a problem. 
Right. Okay. So uh, uh, as the, the situation would have demanded, we just tackled the proximal LED, stented it successfully with a 333 Avrolimus eluting stent. And uh, this uh, uh, sort of stabilized the whole situation. Obviously, that left main was really sinisterly looking at us uh, in a very bad way. And uh, the patient improved dramatically well over the next uh, couple of days. And uh, we thought uh, uh, we would electively plan a staged procedure for LMCA revascularization. So, uh, so what we thought was the, uh, uh, we would do a physiological assessment, although we knew it was pretty safe, at a later stage and plan a uh, revascularization. The syntax score was calculated around 26. We had a hard team meet as long with the family members. And the eventual decision was to go for an LMCA bifurcation PCA on a selectively uh, staged date. And that is today. We are two weeks, uh, around uh, a little bit more than two weeks away from the, uh, 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 the index event. And here we are. And uh, so I think, the, what's the next slide? Yeah. So I think we'll shift on to the screen, please, now. The first angio. Could we shift on to the angio? The... Yeah, so we've uh, done, we've, uh, we've gone through this uh, a little bit of the procedure. We did an uh, angiogram. Could you shift to the angiogram? Yes, so this is what we got to see today. As you can all see, we've got a Medina 111 uh, LMCA lesion at the bifurcation there, a patent LED stent. Uh, uh, good distal vessels, and you can see our stent is still flowing uh, two weeks down the line. Uh, screen, please. Yeah. We can also note that there is a, a distal OM lesion. Who's, who's controlling this? Uh, let's control that. Yeah. So what we, uh, we, we didn't, uh, we, we just thought just to objectify the situation. Uh, so our, the, the plan at hand is a distal OM lesion and tackling the LMCA bifurcation. So we did an RFR of the LM. And could we show the uh, FFR screen, please? FFR screen, please, yeah. And an FFR screen, as I don't know if you guys can see it, it came to be around 0.84. So uh, as you can see, it was a straightaway uh, significant lesion there at the L, uh, left main. We didn't go for a high premium induced based uh, study thereafter. And uh, yes, okay. So we thought that's it. We didn't uh, do uh, an FFR towards the LCX and we thought we'd go ahead with the uh, procedure. A dedicated two stint strategy, uh, obviously considering the tight lesions in both uh, areas, the first procedure was to tackle the distal OM stent. So we've done that. Dr. Shafiq, we can go to the next, uh, this thing just, Dr. Shakfiq will uh, uh, guide us to what we did to the uh, uh, thereafter. Yeah, I, I think, uh, Safiq, uh, your video is seen and uh, your audio is. Just speak a little louder. Yeah, so uh, what he yeah. just mentioned was we just uh, stented the uh, distal OM lesion with a, a 2 5 yeah. stent. Yeah, understandable. I, I hope you are audible there. To and the, now, uh, we are, the now, now we are. So we tackled the OM lesion, and then uh, we thought we'll go ahead with the LM bifurcation uh, PDCA. So Dr. Shafiq will explain what we did uh, after the OM stenting. Right, I think we can go to the OCD run, right? Could you shift to OCD, please? Which are you going to show? Yeah, this is the uh, LAD pullback. Okay, LAD to LM pullback. So uh, as you can beautifully see, this is our stent, which we uh, did uh, uh, a couple of weeks back for the proximal LED, well opposed. We didn't do any imaging back then, no time for that. But as you can see, the opposition markers well opposed. We got a flat white line there. Uh, no major issues, uh, okay, a little bit of plaque prolapse, but there we go. And there comes the proximal LED lesion here. 
uh, and pretty widely paid. And this is the LMCA bifurcation, circumflex, and this is the LM. So we uh, sort of did a measurement here where our uh, proximal LED was uh, measured to be around three-ish. And the uh, proximal reference for left mean was around 3.5, 3.6. And we could you show us the circ run, please? So uh, as we're all very well aware, uh, the object of uh, doing a pre-run OCT, uh, as is the very famous algorithm, the MLD algorithm, to check for morphology, the lesion length, as well as reference diameters. Are we seeing the circ? Is this the circ? Go to the circ, please. So we got the uh, LM and uh, LAD parameters there. And this is the circ pullback coming up. Yeah, so this is our OM stent here. The opposition a little bit, uh, not too bad there. The, so this is our reference segment here for the circumflex, uh, the proximal circumflex here, the uh, uh, LMCA bifurcation coming here. So, uh, and the LM again, uh, proximally. So Dr. Shafiq, we, uh, so uh, what we had done was we, uh, measured the uh, circ distal uh, reference to be around 2.8. So that's yeah. Mm. So that's why we have taken a three stand. This was a lumen to lumen, uh, a lumen to lumen diameter. So we upsized and taken a three. Exactly. Am I right? Precisely. This is yeah. a 323 abdominal cell loading, elevating stand in the proximal circ. So uh, could you just uh, explain what is the strategy which we chose for this uh, particular? Uh, so just yeah. for our this audience here. Uh, Medina 111 uh, LM bifurcation standing with a left main and LED having almost identical diameters and uh, uh, circumflex uh, with a smaller diameter. So uh, we were uh, with an angle of around 80 degree. So we uh, thought we would take a, a two stent strategy considering the diffuse nature of the circumflex disease. And uh, uh, the best strategy in a left main uh, would be a decay crush uh, so that uh, uh, when there is a disparity between main branch and side branch. And uh, so here we are with our uh, uh, side branch stand in position with a, uh, around two, three struts into the left main to be crushed and a balloon of 3.5, 12 millimeter in the LED. Across Could you go to the angio screen, please? Angio screen. Crushed. Angio screen, yeah. Just... Next, please. So uh, as you mentioned, the DK crush strategy, Next. a DK crush strategy with uh, the circumflex stent to be yeah. measured mm -hmm. as around three, uh, a three uh, twenty-three. Am I right? Yeah. Yeah. Next. So we've got uh, as per uh, for those. Uh, I mean, uh, so the stent deployment. The stent deployment and what Next what please. balloon do we have there, Dr. Shafiq, on the uh, two? Uh, three point five into twelve. Okay, millimeter as a standby for balloon. crushing, right? Yeah. Next perfect, thing. perfect. So that's the uh, LCX stent this deployed. Is immediately after deployment. Perfect, okay. perfect. And we removed the balloon and the wire from the side branch and uh, did the crushing. And this is uh, we crossing uh, uh, the crushed segment through the proximal strut. Next, please. And after that, we uh, dilated with 1.5 mm balloon. And uh, now we are ready for the uh, I think uh, uh, I think if the moderators would agree, uh, I think that's one of the uh, uh, is that one of the challenging steps here, the recrossing through a crushed stent, and there's always the confusion of the proximal versus distal struts in a DK crush. You go through the proximal or the middle cell cells, uh, whereas the other bifurcations go through the distal strut. Uh, uh, I hope our chairs and the uh, expert panelists are actually yeah, hearing what we are, you're saying. We are exactly following the steps. Uh, that was This is a great uh, piece of combination where the patient presented as the ACS, where you guys fix the culprit of the culprit first LAD, then moved on to the left, stem, uh, left main bifurcation at a later date. I would have liked, if we would have done a physiology for that osteal, uh, because in OCT, osteal LCX was, angiographically, it was looking... Um, uh, disease, but uh, OCT-wise, the osteal LCX was looking not that yeah, so, bad. Uh, we, 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 we actually pre-dilated and did the OCT uh, oh. because we had a... Uh, yeah, we, uh, that's why a it's, yeah, because yeah, I didn't yeah. see any pre-dilatation in due dissection over there. Yes, so it, exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's, that's, that's why it was a little, looking a little ugly at the LM bifurcation. Oh, 
we did an RFR and since it was significant, so that's why we yeah, thought we just... I saw Madhu it. on uh, floor. I think I welcome Dr. Madhu. Uh, nice you can click on for the discussion. Yes, thanks. Thanks, Madhu, for sparing time. Please. Now, now just a question. I mean, see, as uh, you were saying, Shiva, I mean, the circumflex, why uh, did you really want to go straight in for a two-stain strategy or could you have tried a um, provisional? Because the circ it is restricted to the ostium and didn't look too bad. So did you really want to do go straight away with a two-stain? Two? Yeah, I think the, 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 the floor decision was that the Austral significant. Actually, we thought that the Austral circ was actually, mm -hmm. in fact, a little bit more tighter than the LED. And preserving that as a side branch was one of our primary important, uh, especially yeah. since yeah. the LED is an infarcted area. And uh, right. suppose a suboptimal result in the circ would be probably less than desirable. Is that was the, uh, uh, the, the team planning at that point of time. Uh, would you agree, Dr. Shafiq? Yeah, in, uh, in fact, uh, I would like to throw a spanner in this. I, what would be your opinion of doing FFR to both LED and circumference? Yeah, right, LED and uh, circumference. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, it's not the question of, you know, FFR. I mean, you know, there is a lesion and circumference. What I'm wondering mm -hmm. is, I mean, if you could, you know, just do a provisional. And even if the provisional is just does not mean a single stain. Even in the provisional, if the stain, the, the results are not good, you can always put a second stain Agreed. if needed. But I agreed, thought it was, since it was restricted to the ostium, did you really want to go straight in with a plan two stain, or could you have tried a provisional? That is the only question. Yeah, yeah. No, no, but uh, I agree with yeah. you, uh, Doctor Madhu. But my question Dr. is, Madhu. was the LED significant to the LED yeah. deserved an FFR also? Yeah, I think Harish question was very understandable because it was basically an ACS scenario where the patient was very sick. Angiography on day one was different, and he got the patient back on table. The things can change uh, in the LM um, arena. We, you could have uh, took more time on um, methodical evaluation by imaging as well as physiology, combining both. Now we have a combined trial available. And uh, we could have, as rightly said by Madhu, why not uh, uh, provisional to start with and later on take a call on LCX ostium or like Harish saying, why not to begin with physiology for the both arms and decide. I think that's a valid point taken. Uh, we, uh, again, um, we are not taking decisions uh, on angiography based when it comes to the indication. So when you are taking uh, imaging uh, only to optimize your uh, results, I think we are now way forward in imaging, uh, not only to optimize, uh, to st stratify our decision making from the involved with the imaging and physiology as a tool uh, from the beginning and to uh, structure your whole therapy. But we are we are we are with the team here because you guys know uh, what how the LM was ugly looking on day one uh, because we have to go with you because you guys did OCT after the preparation of both osteo so we have to go by you. Yeah. The, so the the, yeah, the team. Madhu, uh, the, the thought process was yeah. uh, when we uh, started off uh, we thought Lovely. that the osteo, uh, the disease in the circumflex is uh, from ostium to uh, mid circumflex it was diffuse and the plaque, plaque burden was high. And that was the reason we considered uh, a two-stain strategy. And uh, when we started off, we had a plan to interrogate physiologically both vessels and do an OCT run. So, but when we got the OCT in LED, and after that, when we extended uh, the distal OM, he started having pain with the wire in the circumflex. Then okay. we had to rush through the process. We did not do an OCT run before dilatation. So we dilated and then we did an OCT run in both vessels and that was the circumplex uh, OCT that was uh, seen. So Dr. So, Shafiq, where have we reached right now in the procedure? Yeah, so now uh, we have... Uh, so I, I think we've uh, deployed the circumflex tent, we have crushed it and uh, our we recrossed it. Done. We recrossed it and have, uh, we finished with the first kiss, have we? Yeah. We finished with the first kiss. That's perfect. Yeah. Now, the first deploying... cross, uh, you guys did a proximal or mid? Uh, was it angiographically confirmed or any imaging yeah. tool was yeah. there yeah. to confirm it? it was Be proximal. Because it was looking to me a more kind of a classical crush because good amount of stents were Harish and Madhu. Uh, what, what do you think? A good amount of stent was protruding into the uh, distal LM. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I thought. Yeah. Yeah, yeah you, I you mean, uh, we plan for a yeah. couple of uh, two to three mm. Uh, uh, I think this kind of a classical crash pre-parked balloon is very, very mandatory. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, you will have a real trouble. So don't uh, skip this step of uh, pre-parking. Even for a mini crash, 
Uh, I would yeah. rather recommend to pre-park the balloon always. Don't take a chance on that. Yeah, yeah. we already did that. Agreed. We Agreed. crushed also. Totally so think, uh, it, it, when you're doing the DK, do you uh, use two balloons, one for the um, sizing to the LED and one for sizing to the left main, or just one, one balloon for the crush? During it, crushing? Yeah. But when you crush the stain, do you, do you yeah. use a distal balloon based on the size of the LED and another stain, another balloon for the size of the prox or the left main to ensure that the stain is completely crushed? You're do you do that? I mean, just to crush. keep the discussion going. I think okay. this is a great, great question, Madhu. I never thought of uh, this idea of crush balloon. I Actually, always take based on yellow, but you can invade the trouble on Austrian LED. You can make a puff over there. Okay. I think this is a valid okay. point with Madhu is uh, raising because you need to crash, which has to come across the uh, LM, getting into the LED, overlapping into the LED. I think this is a great idea. What we can do is size it to the LM, uh, keep it uh, as uh, lesser amount of balloon is uh, protruding into the uh, astial part, or you can down, balancing between the LED distal reference and to the LM. Uh, I think we need this. Uh, this call is very valid. Now, because Absolutely. this is a new the, the uh, Dr. Chen when he talks the about the topic. new modification of the DK crush, he says you should have uh, two two, uh, two balloons crunch. for the crush, one for the the size to the uh, the LED, and other one second sizing to the left main to ensure then that back. the stain is completely yeah. crushed. Because otherwise the stain may not be crushed, and the wire would again go between right. the two layers of the the stain. So, mother, you mean Absolutely. to say first to crush Absolutely. with as per the LED size? Yes. Then, uh, then, then come back to the uh, yellow base, then f further improvise on the crash to go ahead a, with the steps. Like take a okay. three balloon for the LED and a 3.5 for the left main and crash with a 3.5 for the proximal stain, which is coming into the left main, a larger balloon to ensure that the stain is completely crushed. I think crushed. The, definitely this is the point for the day out of this live case. Ab absolutely. Because totally uh, this is uh, many a time, uh, either a... you, by, if you size it to the LED, you don't crush adequately. If you size it to the LM, uh, you may uh, cause injury to the uh, LED. Fantastic. LED. Harish, have you thought of this uh, yes, idea sir. of crushing? Yeah, yeah. in fact, uh, this we learned the hard way before uh, the DK crush, this trial came in. And we realized we used to have struggles going into the side branch through right. the stand starts because we had not crushed it adequately. And as okay. you said, if you didn't have the second balloon with you, and it would be a disaster many a times to get the second balloon across. Right. Absolutely. I think I think the, uh, yeah. the live case uh, team uh, can go ahead with their steps and yeah. tell yeah. us so where they're exactly. on. So what's happening on screen is I think Dr. Shafiq is taking the LM to LED stent. The LM to LED stent. We have taken a, um, yeah. a 3523. Yeah. A 3523. Uh, are we right. overlapping this with the previous stent, Dr. Shafiq? Absolutely, yeah. Okay. okay. Can you go to the cranial, please? Yes, sure. Do you cover till the ostium, Shafiq? Again, just to keep it going. Yeah, I, I think we uh, sized it uh, just for an 8 mm port. Uh, that's how we uh, measure the length of the stent. All right. Uh, Shafiq, if you look uh, at the size of LAD and LCX, your LM looks like diffusely deceased. Uh, actually, there yeah. is no uh, reference for the LM. Uh, why not? Uh, you could have come all the way as Madhu, Madhu was. I think the Madhu was pointing that only. Yeah. If it looks uh, like uh, your LM is a whole lot. This see, look at the size of the LM. Uh, but uh, uh, can uh, we have a relook uh, at the OCT? Pro, 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 uh, I could show you the OCT, which isn't which isn't looking too bad though. Yeah. The diameter what we got uh, was uh, inner to inner was three point. Eight, nine, yeah, yeah, uh, and three point yeah. four on the LED. So there was not much disparity between the distal left main and the LED. So that was right. the reason I went for one single shot of crush. Otherwise, I totally agree with Madhu. I would uh, definitely prefer a sequential. So you mean uh, to say, Austral LM was disease free and uh, LM shaft the EEL was somewhere around three point eight nine. Yeah, we yeah. we got 3.6, 3.8 also. So yeah. basically, you guys are putting now uh, three five stent or three five, exactly. three five, yeah, three five. Three five. five. So uh, what planning is your have um, a with a four? So you you are planning to stretch it to four or uh, three point yeah. Uh, yeah. seven five? Fourth balloon we have planned is four. Four, right? Then it is fine. Okay. 
So what what, what stand you got in for LED and L LCX? Is it both three? No, uh, yeah, what was LCX stand size? It's the LED LED stand was the size one ACS day. It was a uh, the circ stenting was. Uh, are you asking the LCX or the LED? Uh, LED the earlier one ACS. Yeah, the, uh, the, uh, yeah, non, the, mid, the, the non, uh, that's proximal a, disease. That's, yeah, that's a three o thirty three. Three. What was the LCX now? Um, three, which three. was got crushed. Three. Uh, so three, three plus LED. three uh, six. Six means yes. it should become somewhere around uh, four point oh. four. Um, I think your uh, LM is. I think if you touch it by a four balloon and uh, if you optimize by one post stent OCT, particularly for the LM, uh, definitely I think you should optimize the LM because I feel uh, the LM will grow up. What what Madhu and uh, Harish feels? Four balloon, please. Oh, yeah, I, I agree with you. Uh -huh. The LM will easily take a four o, very easily. It it looks bigger than a four o actually. I'm surprised OCT is showing five. Showing, yeah. In fact, I'm surprised the SCT is showing three point eight. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think uh, it's going to be the L, isn't it? So. Yeah. The uh, British. Can you shift to OCT, please? Can you shift to OCT, please? Yeah. If you can see our OCT here, that's our uh, bifurcation. Have. Is the OCT screen visible? Yeah, yeah, we can see that. Yeah, so that's where we dilated it. And here's your uh, mid shaft. It's, uh, 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 we thought it wasn't diffusely diseased as would have been seen in the yes. angiogram, but yeah, this is how it, this is how it went. And can you get into some part of healthy mid shaft and get the EL? Yeah, then now you can see the EL. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah so uh, this is what we measured. Could you just show uh, to, From two opposite quadrants, maybe from one yeah, o'clock yeah, yeah. to seven yeah. o'clock. Clear stand, please. Yeah, we we we, we uh, checked. Yeah, this is, this is fine. This is fine. This looks. Yeah, cool. take this one. This will be more than four. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, there you are, five. four. Yeah. Yeah, the EL to EL is coming out to be four. Yeah. yeah. It's so, luminous four, isn't it? I think luminous four. Luminous four. So EL would yeah. be. EL will be four point five. Always the so automatic you, OCT. Yeah. The automatic is always lumen. Lumen. Yeah. So the EL lumen. is always measured by us. So EL yes. would be 4.5 years. Yeah, that's what I said. Yes. When, it be when you guys are putting two, three more stands in the eye, side arms, it, it should be two thirds of that. Six yeah, into exactly. zero point six seven eight. Measures, uh, the ones which I told you were all lumen measurements, not the yeah. EL ones. Yeah. So yeah. that makes it a you need a 4.5 pot here. 4.5 pot, yeah. Absolutely. So this is what Ziyatari was pointing. making. When you come into larger vessel, um, a little bit, uh, see, there is a, if you want to be closer to the uh, IBUS uh, sizing, you need to be EEL rather than lumen based. But provided when you are taking an EEL, make sure you are in a healthy uh, site. Yes. Not much plug and you are able to see more than 180 arc of EEL and you are measuring the EEL in two different um, quadrants and two Averages of two measurements. I think we need to sp spend little time on that. Perfect. You guys are going four, well. For O uh, pot, yeah, the, I'll the, be recrossing and doing a casing. Can you go back to the angio, please? And after that, we'll, de we'll do a. Yeah, so what's uh, happening? Uh, you go back to the angio. angio. Go back to the angio. Yeah, so I think the uh, the LMLED is done. Go back. So the, yep. now we are in the, the step of a stent crash, isn't it? After the kiss. And have for the stent to crash, you had, guys have done a part for the LM part of the stent, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, uh, prior to recrossing. With the four balloon, yes. Yeah. And we're going to recross again. Uh, uh, just to uh, uh, while he recrosses, uh, uh, is there still any controversy? I mean, uh, there was a recent paper which I saw with respects to lumen to lumen versus EL to EL. I don't recollect this study. Uh, is there some controversy again regarding actual uh, stent sizing? Or although the current guidelines go for lumen to lumen upsize by 0.25. It's very simple. If, if, if you are making a lumen or EEL in a very healthy area, ultimately you are going to bargain to the normal sizing. 
in a normal area where there is a plot free if you take a lumen if it is 3.75 it's going to be 4 and if you are taking an el 4.25 again going to come down to 4 the point is when the when when the entire uh, lm is uh, you got a lucky you got one mid shot uh, you are able to see an el when the problem comes with the oct when there is a whole lot of diffuse disease there where you get trouble in landing where you have to imagine the el get somewhere to quarant el and measure it particularly exactly. when there is a diseased uh, vessel and el based measurements are better what, what madhu and uh, harish uh, do you agree in that yes oct sizing healthy vessel against diseased vessel lumen versus el your thought process yeah for me i uh, i look at both the measurements and then uh, come to a decision that's that's perfect that's what yeah. Uh, yeah. I, i never rely on one because one may yeah. not be the right one perfect so that's what the automatic the oct automatic uh, lumen measurement tells you were uh, lumen length so you have to just exercise the el and yes. balance between madhu yeah now do, do you have a different uh, Normally, if we take the lumen, you go by upsize by 0.25 or 0.5, and we take EL downsize by 0.25 or 0.5. Okay. And again, it depends on the size of the vessel. I mean, if it's diffusely diseased, then obviously you have to take a EL and not just a lumen. Perfect. Perfect. Agree. Agree. So, uh, Dr. Shafiq. Yeah. We have re recrossed after the. Yeah, I just did, and I deleted, and let's go and. Uh, do you do want to uh, do kiss? an OCT to confirm your uh, wire crossing after the final kissing? We'll I don't think. Uh, so, how often do uh, uh, does the, the expert panel uh, does an OCT to confirm the wire crossing of the proximal versus distal struts? I think that has to be done before the first one. I think the second one, yeah. it's not really going to matter. Yeah. I think the first time when you crossed, you should have checked right. whether you are at the proximal strut or the middle or the distal. Right. Agreed. Sir. Sir. Because in this uh, DK cross distal is not ideal. That's the only problem. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Middle proximal. You'll be outside right. the stand. Yeah, you'll be outside the stand. Then the ostium won't be properly covered. I think for now the DK cross for both the cross it has become non-proximal and yes. non-distal. Non-proximal. Make non it very simple. Yeah. <laughs> but okay. proximal barb mid but ideally mid but never distal never distal yeah yeah exactly. see what happens for the first cross when you do it so proximal you are going to go sub, uh, behind the stent for similarly for the second cross if you go and go too distal mm -hmm. you are going to take away the metal away from yeah. the carina uh, carina so we want we want metal all around the ostium absolutely so does it, the people say no, no non metal carina that doesn't mean no metal at the carina so i think uh, we we can balance between these uh, crosses just for uh, again for discussion sake how often would uh, uh, one, suppose if that LA, uh, if the lm was a culprit lesion in an acs situation how uh, comfortable would one be in actually doing a complex procedure in an in an acs situation you know suppose i think the great the great learning out of this case was it is not only the fixing the culprit vessel culprit of the culprit when such a uh, angry looking this is sitting at the uh, left main bifurcation uh, in an acs where the uh, osteoproximal led is seen uh, plaque rupture probably at the proximal led fix that get the patient on a different day evaluate the distal lm methodically uh, i think madhu and harish uh, also agree with me in that part oh. but in, uh, actually we had a case where we had a lady who came with a distal left main bifurcation with an uh, acs that's where uh, the whole uh, discussion yeah, will actually go go whether would you do yeah. a, would you do a dk cross at that time or would you do a provision just a provision uh, i think that's I, I why think we are looking for the papers difficult. of uh, culprit versus complete yeah. i think this distal left main uh, disease will uh, make a philosophy more into complete revascularization because you will be now uh, not only complete compelled to reverse crease completely so i think uh, that's why the entire community is moving towards uh, why not complete probably we are getting more uh, data out of this because we are compelled to intervene the non culprit vessel and they were started behaving well and why not probably these are all the areas which started people to think um, even in index pci why not make it complete but definitely not in an unstable patient in a definitely in a stable patient we can consider together 
milieu putting too much metal is something which i am not too fond of if it just also, but if it diffusely diseases both ways then obviously you don't have a choice you have to go for two stain in which case it be dk crush but if it's just a ostium and i think it will be provisional you yeah. know yeah i think if you fix the culprit vessel when you get the flow and when it is thrombus free see you are basically you have to convert an acs into a non acs kind of uh, anatomy now think quietly if you are going to have there is a high grade disease sitting at the lcx and there is a high chance of going to compromise the side branch ostium then you begin with the side branch ostium if you think culprit vessel is more in trouble side branch ostium is less angry looking then i say i say go with madhu that make it as a provisional and take have a look at the side branch uh, then i think uh, uh, the philosophy behind is convert the acs into more stable not only in hemodynamics also clinical also angiographically make it thrombus free make it plock not angry no more angry looking then take a colon uh, two arms as per uh, predictability of which is going to close up front then start working on that arm and fix the other arm back to our case i think the uh, second case dr shafiq is over yeah what would the chair uh, recommend for a final pot uh, of four was it a 4.5 I would uh, recommend the OCT run. I think uh, let's do an OCT run. Yeah, yeah that's what. Yeah, see, we just do an OCT and see how it works. Kind of, in between on OCT run, also these these kind of ACS vessels keep growing. And look at here, two side arms are big. Um, so in between on OCT run, also will give an an idea. Instead of going at the beginning itself high sized to avoid a breaching of EEL. um we, you can take in between on ocd also yeah in fact yeah. you know uh, uh, with now with uh, how we have evolved with ocd uh, we do no longer take angiogram we take angiogram with ocd so anyway you save that yeah perfect that becomes a 3d angiogram yeah. and if you Harish, switch the, how often uh, do you do uh, ocd in acute stemi interventions unfortunately most places i go doesn't have an ocd so i have to rely on ios Okay, so acute intervention almost never have done an OCT because we don't have the centers where I go. Uh, Doctor Madhu, I, I think Sivan Madhu would be the better people for that. Prime, primary, I I don't do too much of imaging, unfortunately. I There just trying to. Because Shiva would be the man to. Do yes, Shiva. <laughs> no, I think again the statement uh, is uh, the, the patient comes more important to us than imaging. Uh, make sure the artery is going to tolerate your uh, contrast delivery and catheter being parked for some time. Uh, the thrombus yeah. getting embolized. I think you have to take all in touch. At the end of the day, the safety should come first. Uh, then comes the success and optimization. If any of you are tools you. going to question your safety, I think I will hesitate to consider that upfront. Okay, there is a surge in uh, uh, in Europe uh, about they encourage a lot many centers uh, in doing. They, they uh, basically do that because they do all kind of um, handling the thrombus better, uh, make sure that artery is flowing, thrombus is proper properly taken care. Then and, they do this, and their patients agree. generally come earlier than our mm. patients. Yes, yeah. 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 that that may be the reason they are well loaded. they reach on time and yeah. um, they have they have much less thrombus than what we yes. see perfect because perfect we can we can, we can see it? ourselves you know when it's 7 or 8 hours post uh, index pain the thrombus is so much and you know you a slow yeah, flow yeah. I, you don't yeah. really want to waste so much of time inside the vessel but yeah, anyway do you think we also will catch up or <laughs> i don't think so <laughs> so oct is becoming popular day by day so how about you yeah, how, how many how unlike i was Yeah, what like was the has a great scope in uh, ACS. ACS, of course. Yeah, not no, only yeah. for defining the uh, which made us erosion or uh, erosion to differ extent, 
Um, yeah. In particularly in calcific, in elderly people, uh, calcific nodule, if it is particularly in inferior lumbar, mid RCI, I think there are certain areas it helps. Yeah. In fact, Shiva and OCT many a times can help us in avoiding a stand completely in yeah, an ACA situation. Stand, yeah, absolutely. Youngsters, smokers, yeah. uh, non atherosclerotic, thrombot, pure thrombotic. Yeah. Thrombot, yes. yeah. So we've just finished the OCT run here. Uh, could you just uh, show the OCT screen, please? Looking great. Uh, the automatic lumen profile is yet to come. The long axis is really looking yeah, yeah. enlarged. Your expansion index would be great. So this is our new stand coming up. We would like out. to actually see two things here. One is uh, the body of the left main and the ostium of the circumflex in OCT. Yeah. The ostium circle looked okay, actually. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Could I you just show us the left main? Yeah. Just go to the left main. Yeah. Okay. This was our. So there's some the mala position there, but that could be. Is it the circumflex coming there? Yeah. That's. That could be a branch coming. Yeah. Branch. That's a carina. Yeah. This is circumflex. Yeah. This is the circumflex. Okay. This is the circumflex coming here. You want to. Can you please concentrate on the left main? And then come back to the left main. Come back to the left main. Just see how well that is. Do we need to go okay. to? Pro so what I think it's. Think? I think Do you we need haven't to take another, another one just for the left main? Yeah, what probably. Yeah. Probably, yeah. One more for I, just I the left main, yeah. Looks we haven't gotten the whole. Yeah, the ones. Yeah, it looks uh, well opposed. Hmm. That's just a complex problem there. Yeah. Either way, it's a big vessel. So OCT, the clearing of the dye would be an issue. So. Yeah, that's our uh, the, that's our uh, circumflex uh, side branch there. Are you ready for another shoot? Yeah, we'll just get a new recording here. All right. I'm seeing Rajbal there back. Uh, Rajbal, please, uh, you are a more eloquent operator. You, you you can share your real world experiences here. Here is an AC scenario where they fix the LED first. Then they came back for the distal left main involving both ostium. Please, your thought process. Hi, Rajpal Shafiqia. Ra Rajpal, you're on mute, I think. I think he's on mute. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Please. Great, great picks and great show, Shivakumar. Thank, uh, thank you, sir. Uh, thank wonderful. you. Wonderful. It looks very good. Uh, I would not, I'm just getting into the case. Let me have a look and then before I say anything. It is almost a topic where it was uh, Sanjeev and uh, Harish Mehta was talking about Australian, Australian LCX, where you were in, where in the beginning. Uh, the similar kind of a case we had uh, from uh, uh, Calicut. Okay. You can uh, you can share your uh, real world experience of uh, distal LM um, with osteal LED without osteal LCX or borderline LCX. Uh, how you deal a whole lot of uh, this uh, LM uh, LED LCX osteum as a whole lot of a bunch with or yeah, without much disease? Absolutely. If the if the LED has an osteal, if there's a true osteal LED, there were times when we used to do the Zabo technique. And uh, we, we used to be very happy with the results, but uh, off late, I have stopped doing true LAD osteal lesions as just LAD. I have always believed that now with current evidence and with my current thought process, I believe you should get into the left main. This is because at any given time, it is impossible for the operator to just stop at the LAD. You know, the patient may take a little deep breath or he may move a little. So to get a true osteum sometimes can be really, really difficult. So if there's a true osteal lesion or something very close to the osteum, I have no hesitation now in taking the stent into the left main and uh, then ending with a kiss. If there's a, if it's a single vessel disease and uh, I, I like to go to the left main. I don't know what everybody else thought process is, but this is my rationale. That's what the same. You are you are on line with all the expanders here. Crossover and get the side branch back either for the future intervention or depending on the pinch 
but uh, very uh, very selective cases to pick up the ostium and that too uh, you are going to miss the target uh, however you are precise i think imaging mm -hmm. will have we have done the uh, oct now, how often you take the help of imaging rajpal no we uh, yeah we are happy to do we are very happy with ivas oct with okay. left brain uh, it, it is good but uh, uh, you want us to bear the cost of the oct catheter and so you know it becomes really expensive okay we we have done an oct we have done an oct of the left brain if you guys want to have a look as to please, please go ahead the, yeah so this is how we optimized we are done with a 4 whether we wanted to uh, there was a question whether we wanted to go up to 4 5 4.5 yeah so uh, just uh, i'll just get back with the lady yeah so this is the uh, karina karina we're going back into the left main so here we go So, would you agree that the uh, uh, position is uh, fairly uh, okay here? I, I, I think it looks okay. So the red part is uh, the L6 mouth, uh, around 50. The the red part is uh, no. The L6 mouth is uh, somewhere here. Here. Somewhere here. So what is that? That's sort of blood? the red part. I think it's some. Is it because of the blood, which is uh, the blood. I think it's a blood blood artifact. artifact. Yeah, I think it's, it's a blood, blood yeah. artifact. Because yeah. if you are seeing the white dots all the way circling. Yeah. 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 What is the panelist opinion about taking the so final uh, pot balloon four versus four point five? We've got one last pot remaining. We'll take a four. Get one, or, or one in the mid shaft. You can one measurement in the EEL. I think if you are okay with that, uh, sometimes uh, the OCT not only helps to optimize, it also helps us to when to stop also, uh, yeah. not to yeah. overshoot. Not to overshoot also imaging helps. We need to respect the interpretation and we have to. Um, adhere to our decision making. It is 4.54 of, uh, it, it looks like more of an EL 4.5? Yeah, yeah, EL, EL to EL 4.5. Yeah. EL itself 4.5, definitely you can take a 4.5 balloon, but don't blow it up too much yeah. and Go just normal. take a shot 4.5, just reach 4.5. Just nominal, probably. Yeah, yeah. 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 agreed. 4.5. Did, did you do a kissing inflation across the circus here? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we just finished that. Yep. So uh, this was just taken for this, the final pot. Mohan, can you decide on the final pot for Dr. Rajpal? Sorry? Yeah, please show the cat screen so that uh, Dr. Rajpal can see what we have Back done. Back to Angio's screen, please. Yeah. yeah. So uh, just to recap, what balloons did you choose for your uh, kissing and how did you go about the kissing inflation actually? And what are your thoughts? Uh, you have any set protocol and how you do it? Yeah, the stent in the side branch was 323. And uh, for first case, we took a 315 uh, balloon in the circ oh. and a 3.5 balloon, uh, 3.5, uh, 315 in uh, LED also. So, so sorry, you, so you stented the circ ostium also, right? Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, uh, so here the balloons are a 30 and a 35. The three five uh, in the I LED and a three O in the. I came late. It was a DK crash or what was it? I came late. A DK, DK crash. DK, DK crash. DK crash. Yeah. DK crash. Okay. Yeah. okay. Shafiq, you said three balloon or three point five in LED. Three five. In the second three point five. Yeah. Three point. And a three O in uh, uh, in the circumflex. So I think we sized the balloons according to the stents which we took the three and a three point five for the uh, kissing. Okay. Clear stand, please. So the final pot happening. So, uh, uh, Madhu, it comes around 4.4. 4.3, 4.3, yes. 4 .3. So either yeah. way, so you need a 4.5 then. Yeah, I think uh, that 3, 3.5 was not a bad idea. That's why the LM tolerated. Yeah. OCT, I think this, this, this exercise should be done repeatedly again and again. Um, having taken the balloon to the distal yeah. reference, you should know the summation of the balloon, what size is going to give for the LM, and whether the LM EL is going to tolerate. I think that should be always, uh, should be, and that exercise should be done by every operator. Uh, did you confirm exactly. whether it was a proximal cross or? It was a mid, mid cross. That? Yeah, we documented that. Hello, I can't hear you. Uh, we didn't do an OCT run to confirm the mid cross, but 
yeah, we sort of used a stent boost kind of thing. Uh, Rajpal, you said you, you make use of IVAS more than OCT in left to main. Um, uh, did you do that exercise for this cross uh, IVAS? Uh, do you have, do you, can you share us some tip how to confirm uh, crossing by IVAS? No, I, IVAS sometimes it's difficult. There's nothing like OCT. The image right. that you get in OCT is far superior. I mean, but Indeed. as all of us are, are very clear, uh, I mean, we should, we should, what we should not have is uh, you can't have a distal cross. Okay. Exactly. Distal most cross, yeah. Yeah. If you have a distal cross, then you make a big hole there and that entire triangle is uncovered by, you know. Absolutely. We were discussing earlier too. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Shafiq, when you're doing the, uh, the kissing balloon, uh, is there any particular uh, pressures to which you go to or, you know, do you go alternate high, low and then, you know, Optimum. I always go. Uh, I always go and high pressure with the side branch balloon first, mm -hmm. and then come down on the pressure and then dilate the inflate the main branch. So high is how high do you go? And final kissing is 20. how much? I 20. went up to twenty uh, with the circumflex balloon, and then brought down to, to fourteen nominal pressure, and then dilated the LED balloon. And that also you go up to twenty? No, fourteen. So individual balloons are high ATM when they come together uh, somewhere around 10 to ATM. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, I think that's perfect. That's what we also do. I think what Madhu telling is also great when you, uh, you can individual balloon, you can go top and when the other balloon is on board, you can keep it, drop it to four, but that's uh, laborious exercise, tough to practice in a, a hurried day. I think uh, this is simple philosophy. Each balloon go maximum than uh, yeah. e together. No, nominal yeah. is not a bad idea. So I think we've finished the... I think the... we have a good dilatation of the left main, actually. Please, uh, can we show the main screen, please? So the second part, a report was done with the 4.5? Yes. Yes. To how much no... ATM? To uh, 14, 14, 14, 12? Nominal. 14, yeah, 14. Excellent. This is what is still a lady. The earlier is still a lady. see the ostium of your left main? How does it look? The ostium? Yeah, ostium. Ostium of your left main. They didn't go up to the ostium, Dr. Ajpal. Yeah. yeah. yeah Madhu, Madhu was asking repeatedly uh, when, when you are um, almost coming closer to I the um, ostium, why not cover up the ostium? Is, is always a call by uh, Europeans. Yeah. Having come closer to the ostium, why not up to the ostium? Not to protrude outside the ostium because we mm -hmm. may uh, damage the strut, we may difficulty in doing the kiss, all that, but you can stay right at the ostium. No, how does the but still, the you can take a call on that the left out ostium where yeah. it is stent free, the bare area. Yeah. You can quickly make an assessment. That's tough now with OCT because catheter is abutting there. Sorry. Uh, dear expert panelists and live case operators, we have 10 minutes more. Um, we can keep throwing some points, um, some take home messages for the participants. Mathu, Harish. Okay, that's our uh, short after the final part. Uh, what do you all think? Was the final short? The exhaustion? I think uh, we have uh, Robert Van Grins with us. Uh, welcome, sir. We're able to see you. And this is a uh, a case of uh, ACS had an PCI to LAD as a culprit of the culprit. And later on, they brought the patient after 15 days for an elective a left mind bifurcation Medina triple one. Um, they have done a DK crash with the final part. It was OCT guided. The second part was done on OCT based your thought process, sir. Actually, I would love to see the initial settings, but please continue. It's, uh, I think you're doing a, a beautiful result. So that, that really looks good. And uh, if you have any points on the discussion uh, on, I think you already did on DK crush or provisional, uh, we'll be happy we to, it, to. We will take you to the right point of our discussion where it was going on. They dropped the stent just short of the ostium of the LM. Uh, how often you do that or you cover it, cover it up up to the ostium? I would, I, I, if, if I see the atherosclerotic disease going on up to the ostium, I absolutely cover up to the ostium. I think the only cases where I avoid going up to the ostium, I think I have to change size of the stents. So meaning for most bifurcations, we are sizing distal or main branch. 
uh, for an LED like 3.5. So if your ostium goes up to 4, 5 or 5, what we see sometimes in Europe, then your step is huge and then you're getting to the limits of your post um, expansion of your over expansion of your 3.5 stand and then if I think it is that large then sometimes I avoid the ostium especially if it's not uh, diseased. So you mean to say when there's a gross disparity between the distal reference to the osteal LM you avoid the osteal LM is that right? Yeah, of course, you have to show, we know, I did do some phantom studies where a 3.5 or 4.0 stand can go up to 6 millimeters if necessary. Uh, but you have to consider that, that if you have a 3.0 stand, uh, you, you might not go up to 5 uh, with your post dilatation. So if it's if the okay. ostium of the proximal 1-2 millimeters is more than 5 millimeters, you will sure have malposition and then uh, I won't go up to the ostium. This is perfect, sir. We have so, a, we have uh, a point can, here. Could you show the final shot, please? Yeah, this is uh, the final shot here. Final screen, please. Dear guys, live operator guys, when your uh, guide is sitting at the ostium, ostium of the LM where the, uh, the, the, the area is stent free, uh, how is your pressure looking? Your yeah. dye reflex is great. Yeah, yeah, and can no you just take a take a help of imaging over there, um, if possible. It is tough, I know. Can I have a roughly idea of that uh, proximal edge? Was it any proximal edge dissection? Uh, the left out area. What is the MLA on clock? In the last can give us somebody can give of idea of OCT runs. In the last couple of OCT runs, we tried to see the OCM, but we could not see the OCM of the left vein. Uh, okay, OCM. right. Uh, I'm sure I was would have been a better. Uh, imaging modality to see those things. Sometimes you can combine also. It just I was take a minute. You are going to just visit only the ostium. Uh, it, see, I always feel IVAS and OCTs are complementary to each other. They are competitive. So cases like this, you can quickly drop in your IVAS catheter, particularly when you left behind the ostium of the LM disease free. And uh, now Rajpal is asking um, what is the MLA over there. I think. Uh, you can, you can drop in, and in I, I was also, if you are not able to comfortably place your OCT there. Take, take, uh, uh, take on this, uh, Dr. Van Gwens, Madhu, and Rajpal quickly. Combining, combining both modalities, modalities, when and for what? <laughs> the audio was not fully clear. There was some disturbances on, on, on your microphone. Combining uh, both imaging modalities in a, in a situation like this, uh, how, how often you do? City and and I was. No, I usually won't do both imaging technologies. Right, um, right. It's a matter of costs, uh, personally as well. But we know it, it is going to give both will give some different kind of information. Right, uh, right. Your main factors about malposition, stent expansion can be visualized with both um, technologies. OCT is absolutely more accurate in uh, having full apposition detection and especially proximal main dissections will be more clearly visualized with OCT. That's perfect, That's perfect. Sir. So, so Billy, one more. Right, 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 if you have a it. large left main, for example, if, if uh, left main is 4.5 and you're not able to see the ostium carefully, would you try and do an IVIS? Like in this case, there was a question whether there's something, some problem with the ostium of the left main. I have to ask you very, 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 Shiva, I think there's some problem with your connection. Problem with audio. Yeah, sorry, you can carry on, carry on, carry on, carry on. Go, ahead. go ahead, go ahead. Some echoes okay, going on the there. Final uh, picture, Dr. Madhu. Be very good yeah. for the ostium. Sorry, Dr. Rajpal, you're saying so, something? Yeah, the OCT may not be very, very good for the osteal of the left vein because it yeah. may be impossible Agreed. to replace the column of blood with contrast. So therefore, IVAS is a good choice for the osteum of the left vein. Uh, what is your experience in using a guideline for seeing the osteum of the left main? No, it will have the same problem with the flush. Uh, the ostium is, is difficult to clearly flush with the OCT, um, so that will be not not preferable. On, uh... Yeah, even if you use a guideliner, you cannot replace the entire column of blood in the ostium 
with contrast because uh, because you have to inject so it's you will never be able to flush out the blood so i was will certainly be superior in that situation that's perfect for the right osteal uh, i was one would always uh, consider rather than uh, looking for uh, shortcuts uh, it never uh, at the end of the day never completely evaluates the right osteal because we need to clear the die problem i think we have only five five, five more minutes quick uh, take home message from madhu rajpal and one wins but excellent result shafiq very well done beautiful thank case you, nicely done <laughs> thank you shafiq salim and uh, uh, salman salman a uh, fantastic coordination great case uh, you 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 have shown us both acs as well as distal lm bifurcation thank you one and all and having uh, served us a very fantastic case now Thank we move much. to our next talk by our uh, master for the evening dr robert uh, van guns welcome you sir professor of interventional cardiology of erasmus rotterdam netherlands he is a master in the field of interventional cardiology he has a lot of publications to his name and is an expert in complex case management i i request dr harish and dr madhu to continue ins for this session over to dr robert wangens so you should be able to hear me and i think you want me to switch to screens to show me the the live screen the, the very presentation you are audible and you can you can you can go ahead with your screen sharing sir So some just points on uh uh one mistake sorry for that one because you know not seeing the right screen Are you now seeing the, the presentation? I think so, eh? Yes. Yeah, we are, we are seeing so. Yeah. No, I uh, use a screen computer with two screens so it's a talk about uh, multifacetal disease in STEMI. I think it's a topic which has been discussed uh, over the last 5 um, years in depth. I hope I can give you some new slides but probably also just my personal experience and some comments in it. So you will all know that the topic is as well known it's the prevalence is is, is a lot in some studies it was 40 to 65% multiple lesions in non infarct arteries and uh, from this study 2007 you can see this one year mortality between single vessel disease double vessel disease triple vessel disease so if you have this uh, presentation of stem i with multi vessel disease it will absolutely have an impact on your mortality uh, the question is can we improve that now Uh, this is a different study. I'm not sure if that's quoted that frequently, but it's an interesting trial because what they looked at uh, was to see uh, what we also called, and I don't think we use that term that frequently anymore, as silent ischemia. And so it was proven uh, that the, this patient had ischemia in the other territories. And then the question was: Was it going to be treated with PCI or not? Uh, or medical uh, on direct therapy and you can see the long term outcomes 5 years 10 years the difference uh, between so this is already a, a signal um to if you do see the ischemia in the rest of the vessels uh, of the territories that you uh, potentially should do uh, uh, reintervention for the other vessels uh, if you look at the end point uh, the direct therapy um PCI versus uh, drug therapy the event rates the hazard ratios and the p values for cardiac death and uh, non fatal recurrent mi of course you always have the discussion if uh, revascularization just symptom driven is is a relevant end point or the angina leading to a revascularization this could be um called of course uh, just patient driven and not an unhard clinical end point 
Now, this is the start of the whole discussion, I would say, because initially 2013, we remember the times, and I, when I went this do my training with Patrick Sarais, it was pretty clear, uh, the guidelines always said, uh, if you have multifessel disease, you should not treat your other vessels, only the culprit, and it is a class three indication. You're doing absolutely wrong and harm to your patients. Now, so this is, was a real uh, a step forward to do to see the primary trial with multifessel disease uh, versus corporate uh, lesion treatment only 46, 465 patients, uh, 36 months. If you go in the large scale or the uh, extended scale, you see the huge difference and ha big hazard ratios between the two therapies. Uh, mainly, again, death, cardiac causes. Uh, from cardiac causes or non-fatal MI. So big differences, important outcomes if you don't treat the other lesions. Now that was followed up by the, the uh, trial from Tony Gerslick, 2015 corporate, uh, somewhat smaller in size, but again the, the same big difference between um, a maze in the, the corporates only or complete revascularizations. Now again, all the details from complete, uh, for maze, all cause mortality, uh, recurrent MI, heart failure. Um, of course, the combined events are, are more uh, significant versus individual endpoints. Uh, some have a bit uh, larger hazard ratio, but all giving a big impression between the two different strategies. Uh, from the Netherlands, uh, from one of my former colleagues from Rotterdam, Peter Smits, who has uh, also left uh, the Erasmus in Rotterdam. Um, big, I think it was a European vision trial, uh, and largely influenced by, by Nico Pels in the Netherlands, who worked on the FFR, and that's why this trial was really uh, interesting, because it used FFR-guided complete revascularization. And that, that I will show you all the differences between the trials in the, in the next trials. Um, the significance in the outcome, so that was published in the New England. Um, again, hazard ratios of uh, 0.32, 0.37 .30 on the revascularization, uh, something on the bypass, which is not uh, that strong. Then the secondary endpoint, the net event, um, Death is not a significant, um, of course, it's still a relatively uh, low event. You see the death, what we have in the STEMI patients um, over one year follow-up is 1.4%, 1.7%. So these patients, and um, we're pretty happy in the Netherlands to live in a country where we have this huge access to the uh, uh, emergency uh, system, uh, patients will have an ECG at home by trained uh, ambulance staff and then being transported to one of the centers who is able to do primary PCI 24-7 and that means in hospital our access time are below 20 minutes usually because we get a signal from the ambulance that, that the patient is being brought to the hospital due to a STEMI. Patients are experienced that if they know the symptoms of chest pain, they should uh, signal for an ambulance. Um, you know, I, I have enjoyed visiting India, but I know also the traffic and also the, the thinking of the of, of the uh, people living there. They say, I will just call my brother, my neighbor, my friend uh, and bring me to the hospital and never call an ambulance. Uh, that That's always also a, a huge loss of time, I, I think, which is, is totally different from the Netherlands. So that's why in these kind of trials, uh, mortality is 1.4, 1.7%. It's it's really, uh, really low. And then, um, if you see what happened to the guidelines, I already mentioned to you before, this is the old guidelines, PCI of a non-infarcted artery at the time of primary PCI in patients without hemodynamic compromise, class three. Uh, level of evidence was B. And only the patient, and I won't go in that discussion because there's a different kind of presentation about the cardiogenic shock patients uh, who, was, who were on class one uh, for multifessel uh, PCI. Now that changed based on these trials uh, to that it might be considered, and that's interesting because, you know, uh, quite some people are saying that we should always do that. And... Um, 
we have to realize, and I will tell talk about also, but it is in the guidelines, uh, patients who are hemodynamically stable at the time of the primary PCI or as a planned procedure, but still after some of the trials, so 2017, it was a to be recommendation uh, that you could do it, uh, still not that we have to do it. Now, I discussed most of these trials with you very shortly and rapidly, and uh, also why we're talking about a study which will be done in the Radboud University Medicine uh, Medical Center, that's a city in the east of the Netherlands, a university hospital where I'm working now. And we will do uh, a different kind of study because if we realize that all the studies were potentially done uh, versus a conservative therapy. And look that, we have multiple options in the multifacetal patient with STEMI direct, so the patient comes in uh, on day or in the evening, nights, weekends, uh, direct multiple PCI, we have the hospital multifacetal PCI, we have angiographically driven PCI, or we have FFR driven reverse collaboration. And that's all the differences between PAMI, Mosin, angiographically driven a study for mostly direct. In corporate, could be done direct or at the discretion of the, of the operator, also in hospital. Then we have uh, Danami multifacetal, which was mainly uh, really a non um, in, in hospital, but not a direct multifacetal PCI um, using FFR again. So, and then I just mentioned to you just shortly before we had Compare Acute, which was mainly done direct uh, FFRs and compare that to the conservative therapy. But what about the conservative therapy? Because I think that's um, uh, a major thing to, to, to consider about um, what, what's going to, to, to happen in there. Sorry, just go a bit too fast. Um, I mentioned to you Danami, Compare, Corporate, Prami, and Complete. Complete, of course, being the last and the largest uh, typical American style study, but all again, also a conservative uh, therapy. What we now have considered talking about uh, doing in uh, Nijmegen as a, as a center, and which will be uh, compared to you, we have to upgrade the non the, the conservative strategy to a standardized uh, strategy which used the optimal uh, system, just like in the Swiss 2 trial where they also had done ischemia testing. Uh, but for the iModern reset, we will compare again such a strategy which is direct multifacetal uh, PCI on physiology driven. Um, potentially with FFR or IFR or RFR, whatever is possible, uh, and compare that to what we then consider the most non, uh, most optimal non-invasive reverse strategy. strategy. Um, we selected uh, CMR, MRI perfusion, to do that. So that will be kind of deferred multifacetal PCI, doing that with uh, um, CMR within six weeks. Now to do this, um, we also have to be sure that our functional testing is uh, correct in uh, in the in, in the S patients. Um, so if we have uh, several uh, issues, so uh, one of that we know that. Uh, PCR with an FFR of 1.5 based on the FAME1, um, the FFR guided PCI compared to the medical treatment of the FAME2, and also from the other studies where IFR was compared to FFR, uh, and that is a shorter procedure if you want to do it like that. In STEMI patients, is FFR qualified uh, to do that? And this is just the, uh, one of the studies done, and we, one of my colleagues presented that. IFR acutely, compared to IFR at follow-up, and you key, can see the, the very great correlation uh, between both uh, technology. So the IFR could be as useful as FFR. Um, although if you look into the details, and this is a little bit a larger population set, you can see that the FFR might drop a bit. Uh, during follow-up, the, the, if you have some recruitment of vessels and you will do adenosine uh, infusion, um, 
you might have some higher increase of flow versus the IFR, which is not uh, that much respondent on the adenosine and the vasculatory uh, possibilities. So I'm just going already to my uh, conclusion slide and just um, I think we should go into discussion and say probably you will ask or think on what is your daily practice in the Netherlands. And that's a bit what, what I summarized in, in, in the end of the study because I think in the Netherlands we have accepted um, doing uh, ad hoc multivessel PCI for the STEMI patients as long as we have these which were the original study inclusion criteria or some patients a bit outside that but that means that the patient has to have not be in shock have to be in a good blood pressure and feeling much better with resolution of the chest pain compared to the pre pre pci setting um, we I will check for ST segment resolution and no reflow. The worse the, the anterior wall looks, if we have an um, LED occlusion and I have to go to a complex right coronary artery, I just want to be sure I don't have too much of this function of my anterior wall before I start doing the right coronary artery. That also involves the assess assessment of the non corporate lesion. So either complex lesions uh, can be defined as bifurcation where you might be um, using two stents, long lesions, uh, which are difficult to cross, potentially go in with a guideliner to get support, uh, calcified lesions, uh, including multiple lesion preparation, uh, high pressure balloons, um, creating a lot of dissections before we implant a stent. I would absolutely not think about doing a rota or another technology in the non-corporate lesion uh, shortly at the STEMI. And uh, just either wait, as say uh, we do, do the in-hospital reassessment, uh, which is still the one of the preferences of the patients. I would say the patients is admitted to the hospital and want to be as much revascularized uh, and done with all the technologies when he leaves before uh, home again uh, from hospital. Um, of course, for CTO, we always do, if we think there's an indication, do that uh, in a stage procedure. Now, there's a lot of patients' uh, preference. There's a lot of patients' feeling. Of course, most of that is related to how much of the chest pain is gone, but the sale of the patients um, do have, of course, in comorbidities. That's just one of the things. Um, that'd be longer procedures if you do the multivessel PCI. Um, patients are just very short on their DAPT. So I think always the risk of having thrombus is higher. Um, now if the patients have some risk factors for having thrombosis, either poor flow or previous morbidity, didn't swallow the medication yet correctly, has been vomiting, uh, all these considers, and then we think um, uh, the patient is not well fit to have a multivessel PCI um, on admission. So this is a, just a, a bit of the personal perspective I, I put on it. I think that also points out to you that, that my opinion is a kind of pro uh, multivessel PCI uh, as much um, during the first procedure, um, but have a um, really um, conservative thing and say, okay, no, this one I like to, to stage uh, either in hospital, sometimes even out of, uh, in a second procedure after discharge. Um, so that, I think these are the things to consider. And I think if I know you all as all experienced operators, you, I think you all have these main factors, these same kinds of factors in your opinion when you make your decision for going for multivessel PCI or not. And that would be my, my short presentation for you to discuss. That was a great presentation, Dr. Robert. Uh, I, even though the data is coming up strongly for complete revascularization, not only in chronic coronary syndrome, as well in acute coronary syndrome, to fill the gap between us and the surgeon. However, it, it's well said that in a culprit vessel, if you end up in a slow flow and no flow, you don't proceed further, just improvise the culprit vessel flow and don't touch the non-culprit. And similarly in a well gone culprit vessel, if the non-culprit looking demanding, again, you stay away. I think that's a great point. You decide a case by case, but take the help of um, physiology to come closer to a reasonable complete or near complete revascularization, either on the index procedure 
during index PCI, which is not very oftenly done, at least on the index procedure pre-discharge after the index PCI. Now I, leave, I, I take the discussion to the expert panel here, uh, whoever around, uh, Dr. Sanjeev Rai, Dr. Madhu, Dr. Harish, if he's around, I see uh, Dr. Makesh and Chantra Shekhar V. Patil. I, somebody can uh, jump in, uh, I can st Madhu, you can start with. Complete versus yeah, culprit okay. only, what is your take on this with the current, uh, the current data coming up? Yeah, Dr. Van Gogh, that's an excellent talk. Uh, just two questions. In a daily practice, when you have a multi-vessel PCI, now do you base it on angiogram or based on physiology? And to what percentage of your ACS uh, you use imaging? Yeah, so um, I think we have sufficient evidence and good, real good support for, from different kinds of studies, even in this study, in the studies done like a compare acute. There is, of course, not so much uh, studies where we compared both strategies, either angiography or FFR-based, physiology-based. But we know that, that physiology-based um, in the FAME studies, but I would also say in syntax too, uh, you do less uh, implantations, you do less interaction to your patients, but the outcomes are better. Doing less is doing more for the patient. So uh, we are strongly, uh, I would say, if I see a lesion, only it's subtotal, so more than 90%, uh, then I won't do physiology. Uh, for most of the others, we were surprised how well the vessel is still functioning uh, at, at that moment and in a follow-up session. So anything below 90%, we usually do an FFR, IFR, RFR um, to make the decision on. And imaging, imaging in ACS, do you use imaging OCT for, for your ACS patients? I would not say per se for the STEMI patients. Um, we are again uh, doing two, uh, a non STEMI uh, study, but also in an ENOCA, MINOCA study, because we see a lot of patients, even with, with ECG changes, ST segment elevations, non STEMI, where we don't understand really what is happening. And there, uh, OCT is the perfect tool to, to better guide what we understand. Do we see a calcified nodule? Do we see a thrombus? Do we see a, a spontaneous dissection? Because really, to put the correct diagnosis to the patients, um, at least based on that one, you can healthy, have a healthy discussion um, to, to what kind of therapy do you want to continue with? Although that discussion is long, uh, but to make the correct diagnosis, at least keep your discussion focused, I would say. Um, so that's where we do. If we have sizing, uh, it's, it's more typical. It's the left main where we will do uh, IFS OCT guided intervention, complex long lesions we might check with OCT. Uh, OCT done in STEMI patients is, is just a little bit the same. If you have good uh, reperfusion, uh, the patient really tolerates it well. Dr. Sanjeev, right, please. I, I'm seeing you listening very quietly, please. Sanjeev, uh, unmute yours. Uh, sorry, I missed the question. What was the question? Uh, just uh, basically, culprit versus uh, complete revascularization in a STEMI scenario. Dr. Robert Van Gunz have a and gave great an idea that it is it has to be individualized. You can take the help of physiology, of course. What is your thought process in STEMI kind of a situation, multivessel disease in STEMI scenario? How often you do complete against culprit only? Uh, see, as a practice, I do culprit only. Uh, and uh, of course, if the flow is good, we, uh, we, we do a lot of OCTs and physiology for the non-culprit vessels and come back maybe on the same admission on the next day or maybe uh, stage it for a different occasion. Uh, the exceptions are if the patient is in cardiac shock or not doing well after uh, opening the very critical vessels. Very rarely, a simple discrete lesions in a non-culprit vessel and as a cost-saving measures. We have, one has to be very pragmatic and practical in our country, country settings. But otherwise, I uh, in a non-culprit vessel, if it's an intermediate lesions, I do the physiology and come back the other time. Even if it is a tight lesion, maybe uh, stage it for the next day or next admission. That's perfect, sir. Even I do the, even for the late percentage, even if they are out of so-called STEMI uh, milieu of 24 hours, 
if I do the culprit vessel, so-called culprit vessel beyond 24 hours for indication of some kind of an ischemia based uh, culprit vessel intervention beyond 24 hours. If at the end of the procedure, my flow is not good, even, even now I don't touch the non-culprit. I think it has to be highly individualized. I think one can take the help of a physiology, whether uh, the, the great question is now, Dr. Robert Warren, how often early you can take the help of physiology? After the intex PCI, if not fixing the non-culprit, how about a, at least physiological assessment of non-culprit combining with the uh, index PCI? Um, doing the physiology in the index PCI is an absolutely good, great thing to do. So that that is, uh, I would say, uh, uh, for the majority of our patients, uh, the preferred strategy. Okay. Um, if the patient, um, what I just mentioned before, so physiology, doing physiology is less tricky, I would say, than doing the, the stenting. You know, we, we all know, we discussed it earlier, long calcified lesions with bands, deep intubations, uh, a lot of lesion preparation. That's, that's where the risk is. It's not in doing the IFR. The only difference is that doing RFR, FFR, um, uh, in the same procedure is that 30, 40% of the patients, you can say, you're done. You don't have to go for a second procedure. Uh, make sure efficiency in your hospital, the patients can be earlier discharged uh, for lower costs for the patient. So uh, a lot of benefits, I would say, to do uh, physiology uh, if the patient is reasonable stable. Even if there's a complex lesion, uh, you get some ID. We know uh, on the positive side, if you think you discuss it is positive or not, because what we do if we think it is a bit more complex, three vessel disease patients who might be surgical candidates, uh, you do a right coronary artery, a circumflex, and you'll say maybe this LED is better suited for Lima, anything like that. If you do uh, physiology there, you downgrade a lot of patients. So we always have these discussions, you know, if I do physiology, uh, it's good for the patients, not good for me because we have less procedures. Uh, if you do physiology in multivessel disease, you're doing only your surgeon's uh, uh, procedures going down because you downgrade your three-vessel disease to two-vessel disease or, or something like that, which is a little bit lower syntax because you only have to do two less complex lesions. So I think it's more complex lesions, uh, three-vessel disease and more extensive disease you're frequently downgrading with your physiology. That's that's perfect, sir. Having said that, do you think there's a scope is more for resting indices than hyperemic indices? Like RFR, when you combine physiology with along with index PCI. Do you think great scope for resting indices yeah, yeah. like RFR? Yeah. Well, um, you know, you have to be sure that the evidence is, is, is not 100% clear on it. Uh, but we have seen so many studies and so good experience with uh, in uh, resting in these sets that they can be as good used uh, as as uh, FFR. And the benefit we are also using, and I'm personally using also pretty frequently, is to do the pullback. And if you have the option to do that angio controlled, angio integrated. Um, with the sync vision of Philips, for example, you know, you exactly see what the contribution of each lesion is, and you might be surprised. So, where uh, you think we might need two long stents, uh, you can do with one spot stenting, uh, and that again makes your heart team discussion totally differently because you say, Oh, I can uh, fix this with, with, with one short stent, or this is so much diffused, uh, I don't think PCI is a good option for this patient. You have a re uh, continuous gradient from distal to proximal uh, with no focal spots, uh, which, which should be intervened on. Uh, well, I think we learn a lot from doing resting indices and resting indices with pullback, and especially if possible, angio integrated. That's perfect, sir. Resting indices with angio registration and pullback. So physiologically, you optimize your focal standing. Perfect, sir. Mathu, Sanjeev, one final comment uh, on Robert's talk, take home. And finally, we can come back to Robert again for a take home. Quick, multivessel in ACS, particularly in STEMI syndrome. 
is it uh, to be individualized or are we, are we moving towards more of complete in your setting, Dr. Van Quinn, do, do you, uh, you do it in the same setting or is this a deferred in the same admission? What is your actual practice in the hospital? I would say 80% um, will be, 70-80% um, will be done um, immediately, at least the physiology part. So that, that will be very frequently done. If after that we have to have to have a hard team discussion, just because patients is by guidelines, three vessel disease, diabetics, you know, I'm not going to do ad hoc treatment uh, before having a hard team, which we usually do the next day with our surgeons on site. Um, and then the procedure will be postponed. And the more complex the procedure, I always tell my patients, you know, I want to prepare for this. I don't want to do it in the middle of the night. I want to be fit. It's a good plan. Plan A, plan B, plan C, five different options. If I have a trouble, how I'm going to fix it. And that's not something I want to do in the night. I can do one simple stand in the night for the other lesion. That's no problem. Robert, would that mean uh, you would be doing the following morning or uh, call them back on the next admission? No, same admission, but first I will look at CK and ECHO. If the, if the regional function is reasonable, re reasonable, so the LV function is reasonable. If I think the uh, LV function is going to recover a lot more in the next days, and the more complex the procedure, the more I will postpone the procedure to be sure that he has as much recovery from his stunning period before I start on, on the more complex other lesion. But we, we know from, from Tagatubu and other stunning is only usually three, four days. So it's, it's the fully recovery is, is not a very long day. Uh, giving the, making it, changing it to what we did in the past, you know, we never, any ACS patients more than four days in the hospital is an, ex is an exception. Uh, just an offbeat question. If you have tremendous uh, thrombus burden, what do you do in that situation? Ah, I, I love I love that question. I would I would love to ask a question to all of you because I don't know what to do. I was used to do thrombus aspiration and that's not allowed anymore. So I don't know what we do. The only thing, if I kick off, but please, please all of the other uh, panelists can discuss with me as well. The only thing what I have learned from this period is saying that okay, there's only one good aspiration catheter after we had all these kinds of different ones, and that's my six French guide catheter. That means left main, osteo LED, first four, two centimeters of the right coronary artery and the thrombus, which is close to two, three millimeters in diameter. I will take that out with a guide catheter. No, no, the next, next people, come. Excimer laser. Laser. Laser, no. Unfortunately, uh, uh, I don't have that option in, 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 in this hospital. Um, examiner laser, um, if I follow all, all the international meetings, I think it's only down to five sites in the US uh, for kind of instant restenosis and then new atherosclerosis with calcium. Uh, there might be some of these indications, occluded stents. And um, what we are now starting, and, and I think we see that in, on every meeting we have, is the shock wave. Um, uh, we did our first experience with it, and it is indeed a very successful technology. Um, and I think that will be uh, a, it's a game changer, although first option for me is still Rota, because usually you have a problem with crossing the lesion with any, any device, so your Rota would open it up. Um, but then we have you know, these very hard under expanded segments where you cross with your balloon and then you go up to 20 atmospheres, 24 atmospheres and it doesn't open up. Yes, these are shockwave candidates. So that's, that, that will be a useful technology and we will see more of that. Thank you. Shall we take up some questions from the floor? There's a couple of questions uh, to the expert panel as well as to Dr. Robert Van Guns. Pratik Gandhi, can you just share the question before moving on to the next session? This is basically a recoil at L6 ostium. 
would you consider R of R? I think it is for the earlier session. Well, uh, we don't uh, differentiate between the sessions. Anybody want to take it? Recoil at LCX ostium. Shall we consider R of R here? There was no recoil to consider R. No, I think it is for the left main. For the left main case, there's some some uh, yeah, there was narrowing no of the ostium. There was no recoil. Yeah, yeah. but the yeah, is good. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> I think uh, it's time to move on to the next session. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Robert. It was a great presentation. Thanks for making it to our meeting, requesting it to be with us as much time as possible this evening and keep sharing your views. Looking forward to host you for our next meeting. Thank you so much, our panelists today, Harish, Sanjeev Rai, Madhu, for sharing their expert views, particularly Madhu stayed for a long time and Sanjeev really stayed with us from the beginning. Thanks for Harish too. It is now time to move on to the next session on stent failure. We have Dr. P.K. Sahu from Apollo Hospital, Bhuvaneshwar. Dr. Giri Navasundi. Thanks, Giri. You joined well ahead of time and you started sharing your viewpoints. And from Bangalore, Dr. Chandra Shekhar V. Patil, I could see you here, sir. And uh, uh, we have Dr. Makesh from Apollo, Cochin, and Dr. Stripal, Bangalore, to share their uh, thought process on uh, stent failure. Welcome the expert panel as well as speakers for the session on due. I request now Dr. Makesh to go ahead with his talk. Uh, screen visible, am I audible? Yes, you are visible and audible. Uh, first of all, thank you, Dr. Shukumar. Uh, two things. One, fabulous meeting that you organized. And secondly, your attention span and your involvement is phenomenal. I can just sit through one, meet, one, one session of the meeting and then you tend to wander off. You have been so involved in the whole thing. And I can see the, uh, the familiar hawks hanging around. Dr. Girish, welcome. So let us now, uh, let us now start off with my talk. Now, it's, I'm, I'm supposed to speaking on classification, pathophysiological findings for stent failure. Uh, when I uh, went through the literature and that's the topic, I found that it is really, really massive and very large. I have decided to select what I thought was relevant. Um, you will have a lot of space to add on. So I expect a lot of people to uh, contribute to the discussion at the end of the session. So uh, greetings from Apollo and Kochi. What is the definition of a stent failure? It's clinical symptoms suggestive of coronary artery disease. That is post-standing, of course. ECG changes. Uh, of coronary ischemia. Further on, limitation to coronary flow as done by the physiological parameters FFR or IFR. Minimal cross-sectional area of less than four millimeters squared or in the normal vessels or less than six millimeters squared in the left main by intravascular ultrasound or reduction of more than 70% luminal area even in the absence of uh, symptoms. This has been defined way back in 2010 by Dr. Douglas Exeter. So what are, the, what are the events that occur? Acute thrombosis, which occurs within 24 hours, subacute thrombosis between 24 to one month, early stent thrombosis within one month of initial uh, stent placement, late thrombosis between one to 12 months, and very late thrombosis after 12 months of initial placement. There may be a catastrophic event that comes in as the, the initial presentation, or it may be just chronic stable angina that manifests. So the manifestation can vary. So there is acute, subacute thrombosis, so what are the reasons for this acute and subacute thrombosis? Uh, I shall classes of uh, reasons and then explain. But uh, drugs, not enough preloading, drug compliance being poor, or the patient has not been given the correct doses of the drugs. This is very common, specifically when you take it for an ACS, you forget to preload or you forget to give the heparin. Both are dangerous. Disposables are an exclusive problem of Indians because we tend to reuse quite a bit of them. If you're not careful with your properly prepared disposables, properly clean disposables, balloons and catheters specifically, if you happen to use, reuse, not very um, well-prepared stuff, you can land up with troubles. So what are the procedure related problems? One most common, incomplete lesion coverage and residual reference segment stenosis. So the lesion is not covered properly, A, there is a part of the lesion that's left out. And even the area that has been left, you can see there's a calcific nodule there and that area has not been expanded. 
you are going to land up in trouble in the next 24 hours. Two, edge dissection. 200 micrometers, more than 200 micrometers, a distal stent edge restoral dissection flap more than 0.31 millimeters. So if it's a, if it's a large dissection and the dissection flap is more than 0.31 millimeters and it is in the distal edge, and if you're not covered it on second thoughts, you're going to land up with uh, acute stent thrombosis. Reference tumor narrowing. Various studies have shown that small final instant MLA of 4.5 millimeters squared or less, below that will land up with stent thrombosis under expansion. So if you have stent struts floating into this thing, suboptimal stent deployment, which in various studies have shown that there is almost, you know, 95.2 percent chances that you land up with stent thrombosis if you have a underexpanded stent in the thing. So what are the criteria? This is from a clinical impact OCT finding study that is a CLI OPCI two study by uh, Francisco Prati. We are, we got to learn this. We got to understand this and interpret it as you like from your personal experience. He studied thousand two hundred lesions, eight hundred and thirty two patients. So if OCT revealed suboptimal stent implantation, then the MACE was almost we are, uh, we are in 59.2 percent chance that you land up with a MACE. Instant minimum lumen area less than 4.5 hazards ratio of 1.64. Dissection more than 200 micrometers at the distal edge. Again, hazard ratio 2.54. Reference lumen area at either distal or proximal stent edges were less than 4.5. Then also you have an hazard ratio as high as 4.65. And it is a very significant finding that if you have, if you have a distal uh, end or a proximal end lumen area less, you land up in trouble. Presence of at least one of these criteria, which I mentioned out of the five, then there is a chance that the, the, in the as an independent predictor of MACE with 95% confidence interval uh, odds ratio of 3.53, the hazard ratio of 3.53. So this is all things associated with worst outcomes. This is natural and understandable. But what is this? In the same study, it showed that not associated worse outcomes, instant lumen area with the mean reference area, if the ratio is less than 70% also, it doesn't matter. But the total area should be more than four. Stent malapposition more than 200 micrometers. Surprisingly, it didn't transfer into statistically significant uh, etiology for stent thrombosis. Intrastent plaque thrombus protrusion more than 500 micrometers did not translate into stent thrombosis. Dissection at the proximal end, even if it is more than 200 micrometers, the flap is not mentioned, but if the dissection extends for more than 200 micrometers, still did not end up in this thing. So you have to, you have to see how statistically significant this is and then make your own conclusions based on what you think is the right way. Now we come to the ISR in, in the, the chronic phase of ISR. Classically defined as a luminal narrowing with more than 50% diameter stenosis of a standard coronary segment or within five millimeters of the stent edge. Okay, these two are defined as uh, instant restenosis. What are the mechanisms? New atherosclerosis, drug resistance, block prolapse, new interval hyperplasia, hypersensitivity to any component of the stent, stent fracture, geographic miss under, under expansion. So I, as I proceed, I, you will come to know at what stages of, the, uh, of, of life does these things manifest and how do they manifest? So what are the predictive factors for restenosis? First is the patient, a diabetic, old age, female, and genetic factors. So uh, it starts in the family. Pharmacological, drug resistance, hypersensitivity to drug or to the polymer. Biological, plasma proteolytic enzymes and matrix metalloproteinases. Mechanical, as I said, stent malapposition, under expansion, edge trauma, geographical miss, or stent fracture. And in the, in the characteristics of lesion, B or C lesion, longer lesion, smaller vessel, calcified, bifurcation, chronic total occlusion, or austral torture segment. So initially, it was the famous Roxana Mehran's classification of uh, ISR. This was predominantly done on, uh, on uh, bare metal stent. So this is, I'll make it easier. This is easy. Type 1A is articulation or gap. 1B is margin. All of them are less than 10 millimeters. Type 1C is focal body and type 1D is multifocal. But again, each lesion is less than 10 millimeters. ISR patterns 2, 3, and 4 are diffuse. 2 is intrastent. 3 is proliferative, may even go outside the stent. And 4 is total occlusion. This was the original classification which came out for uh, bare metal stents. But later on showed that 
um, this particular classification is not exactly tallying with the findings that we get in drug eluting stents. So a new classification by Waxman was uh, for given for the DES ISR, which basically instant restenosis, intracoronary or IVIS OCT imaging was done to identify. This is too crowded, so I have made it into small, small pieces. Type one is mechanical, one A is under expansion. That means you have not deployed the stent well. So that doesn't mean that it has to come out in the next 24 hours. It can come any time in the next five years. So stent under expansion can manifest as a, a ISR in uh, 24 hours to five years. Stent, uh, so these are various pictures, OCT pictures, and this is the uh, histology of a stent under expanded stent. 1B is stent fracture. So if you can see this area, you can see two layers of stent where only one layer has been put. And at the same time, here if you see there is no layer of stent. That is because of the fracture of the stent. This is how it looks in an in a, uh, angiogram. So 1A is under expansion and 1B is stent fracture and it comes under mechanical. Two is biological. This new internal male hypoplasia or new atherosclerosis without calcification. So you can see there is new atherosclerosis. This is a new intermittent hyperplasia, homogeneous, clean, clear cut. Uh, a new intermittent atherosclerosis is uh, heterogeneous. You can see macrophages. You can see new vascularization. And that is how this looks like. And third, two C is new atherosclerosis with large amounts of calcification. You can see in this IVIS image, lots of calcium can be seen in this, uh, in this uh, 2C image. This is a classical image of uh, uh, hemodialysis dependent patient who have intrastent calcification. This is the this is the lumen area in red. This is the calcific nodule. These are specks of calcium. So you can see how badly calcified these guys can get. They're very difficult to be tackled also. Type three is mixed mechanical and biological. Logical, if you have an underexpanded stent with new atherosclerosis, it look like this. Type four is CTO. Type five is when you have tackled one ISR, put another layer of DES, and then it comes out with ISR. So that is type five. So this is the new intimal hyperplasia, homogeneous, bright, uniform layer. This is new atherosclerosis, heterogeneous composition with instant necrotic core, with a thin fibrous cap, with lipid calcification, foamy macrophage accumulation, low works. And I send under expansion, I send area significantly smaller than vessel area causing this. But you please understand that there is no clear cut lesion which manifests with only one feature. That means you will not get a pure near intimal hyperplasia or pure near new atherosclerosis. Invariably, all the lesions have a mixture of all these things put, put together, and we need to understand that. Okay. So now what are the causes of stent failure? This is what I was trying to say. If you have a mechanical complication, including under expansion, it can manifest within the, this side is bare metal stents, and this side is drug eluting stents. So it can happen in 30 days, less than five years, in, in drug eluting stents, less than 30 days, less than 18 months. So a mechanical complication can manifest any time of your life after having put a stent. Intimal hyperplasia in bare metal stents comes in less than five years, while in, uh, in uh, drug eluting stents, it comes in less than 18 months. New atherosclerosis, stent thrombo manifesting is stent thrombosis because of the rupture of the new atherosclerotic plaque. Of course, in bare metal stents in more than one year's time, if there is or just as restenosis in more than five years. While in stent thrombosis in, um, the, in drug eluting stents, of course, also in less than more than one year's time and in more than 18 months, it's much faster in case of drug eluting stents. Late malapposition, I will speak about it later. It is a it is an exclusive feature of drug eluting stents. Stent fracture can manifest like in many mechanical. So 1A and 1B can manifest at any time of the day. Delayed healing and uh, un uncovered stent starts and vessel wall inflammation are all exclusive or domain of the drug eluting stents. So 1A and 1B, the mechanical fellows can manifest at any stage. The, the next, this is another study which came in Jack uh, Cardiovascular Intervention in 2012, which showed that very late stent thrombosis between 650 days Average three, which is more than a year to five years. Uh, cross section of uncovered stents, 33%. So if you have uncovered stents because of not a good uh, endothelialization, cross section with more than 30% uncovered stents, 21.6%. Malapose struts per patient percentage, 5.9. Minimum cross sectional area, 5.7, 5.9, no change. Minimum EEM is a cross sectional area, 19.4 and 15.1 in the controls. 
remodeling index was much higher in the VLST and malapposition area, obviously more in the 4.1 uh, in the, in the uh, very late stem thrombosis. So, and when these were aspirated, when they took out the material which is found, formed in this uh, ISR thing, they found that neutrophils, eosinophils were the most common things found there. So, different new atherosclerosis patterns in drug eluting and biometricins. They don't, they don't behave the same. This was a study which came out uh, in a circulation in 2019, which showed that between BMS, first generation, second generation deaths, this is the conclusion. The frequency of new atherosclerosis was significantly greater in deaths than with BMS group. Longitudinal extension of new atherosclerosis in the stent segment was significantly less in the deaths than the BMS. So you got longitudinal things in the BMS while you had focal things in the deaths. The minimum fibrous cap significance was significantly greater in deaths than the BMS group. So probably the acute MI presentation would have been less in the death group. Why is it important? Because mortality following non-emergent or uncomplicated target lesion revascularization are very high. So if there is no, uh, no TVR, it is 8.9. If it is with the lesion is being revascularized, it's 12.2. If the vessel has been revascularized, it is 11.7. So there's a three percent, the significant amount of statistically significant amount of death increase in uh, patients who land up with ISR. So it's been dealt very carefully. Uh, how do they present? Non-ACS in uh, like chronic stable angina, thirty percent of the cases. ACS unstable angina in sixty sixty percent of the cases. And acute myocardial infarction. It is much less in the uh, in the second generation death group because the fibro cap is much thicker than the first generation and the BMS. So 10%, 10%, and 5%. This is the presentation. One word about late acquired stent malapposition. It's a very new concept. It's a concept which has been ignored. Uh, see, if you have a baseline incomplete apposition, remodeling, it can get resolved and become an incomplete apposition. A no vascular remodeling, it can persist as an incomplete apposition. So there's an area gap in between. Late acquired incomplete stent apposition is where there is, if there is no revascular uh, remodeling, it's because you have put it in an ACS situation. There was a thrombus behind. The thrombus is now washed away, and you have an apposition area where you have late acquired incomplete because the thrombus is in dissolution. Or because of the positive remodeling, the tissue, the vessel has grown out of the stent, and you get a late acquired incomplete apposition. So at the end of the day, you have the stent again back to floating within the vessel without any support from the vessel wall, at least in some areas. These are many, many, very many reasons. Could be because of positive remodeling, could be because of chronic recoil, or could be because of thrombus dissolution, or all of the above. So this is how the post-procedure uh, area looks beautiful. And this is the follow-up area showing so much of the new areas have, have occurred, which is beyond the stents. And this is the area of the, where probably the thrombus is gone or probably positive remodeling. For the OCD people, this is how it looks like. Again, you can see areas behind the stent, which has been become vacant and the stent seems to be floating in this aspect of, this, of the vessel where it is fixed here. So what are the reasons? Very, very many reasons. Surprisingly for me, CTOs, use, use of uh, rota and uh, type C lesions, overlapping stents. What is the solution? New generation test, biodegradable polymer, polymer-free test, cobalt and platinum chromium alloy stents, and bioabsorbable stents are the things proposed for prevention. My next speaker would probably be addressing all this. So what is it that I got to say at the end of the day? Simple. Second generation drug eluting stents have a failure rates at one year that average 5.7 and 8.7 in non-diabetic and diabetic populations. This is a big thing. So if you put 100 cent, 5.7 to 8.7 percent of them, people will eight, nine people will come back to you with ISR. You just got to live with it. Death to, uh, target lesion failure rates do not plateau at one year. All modern dress styles show gradual increase of maze over the time. So it, at the end of the one year, you cannot say that, okay, now you take off your DAPT and you'll be happy. You can be on one aspirin, half an aspirin. You take statin, you can take a stop your aspirin for your dental extraction, whatever. It is not true. You're playing the dangerous game because five-year TLF rates are 9 to 12% in the range in non-complex lesions. So just imagine if it's a complex lesion, where will be the range be? 
so if you think that at the end of the year when you have a when you have a, a desk put in and you are happy with the situation and you can call him off the uh, checklist you are wrong 9 to 12 percent of them land up in trouble and what is the studies which show this resolute outcomes see the uh, see the tlf percentage between resolute and zion suite almost touching 15% at the end of 5 years tlf percentage ongoing annual this is spirit 3 taxes and zions uh, taxes way ahead but then zions also had a 12 to 15% compare again this time between taxes and zions ongoing annual lateral with metal tlf percentage you can see in leaders trial also the mace was shown to be significantly higher as high as 25% in 60 months time so we have, we have not we have not so far reached a stage where we can say that look i put in a drug duty stent your uh, oct shows tab good results and you can be happy for the rest of your life no i'm sorry 8 to 10 per 8 to 15 of them are going to come back to you within 1 to 5 years with problems related to a drug eluting stent so in real world use modern desk fair even less the five year period of rates that exceed 15% this is the actual registry data which says this is igbal and patrick sores which proud to say in 2015 resolute outcomes trial 15% is the tlf in uh, in 5 years of uh, in any any stent that you put so you have to keep your you, we have to have rethought on what and we have to have modifications on the platform on the polymer on uh, on non polymer non platform stents basically the scaffolds we have to see how we can solve this problem how do we solve the problem luckily that is not my part of the talk that is dr shripal's part of the talk so from utopia so what next and how to address the problem i hand over to dr shripal to please take on from here thank you that was a very extensive and exhaustive talk by dr makesh thank you sir as we see uh, dr stripal here with the permission of expert panel sahu girish and chandrasekhar we will quickly move on to dr stripal welcome you sir and go ahead with your talk thank you very much and thanks for having me on um okay i'm going to share my slides so i think that was a excellent overview and kind of uh, you know lays the platform uh, to my talk um so what i'm uh, going to uh, discuss today is uh, kind of the current approaches in management of stent failure so you have, you've implanted a stent it's it's failed and what do we do now how do we uh, manage uh, uh, patients such as that um no relevant disclosures for this particular uh, talk um it, some of the first few slides may be a repetition of what you've heard so far but uh, there are some important uh, points that i want to make um so if you look at uh, stent failure i mean typically we define this as either restenosis or stent thrombosis um you know we have we have come a long way so for example this is data from the scar registry 94000 uh, consecutive stent implantation looking at bare metal stents in blue uh, the drug eluting stents older generation drug eluting stents in green and in this pale or yellow line uh, a newer drug eluting stents So on this left panel is a rate of restenosis and the right is stent thrombosis. Clearly newer generation uh, platforms do pretty well and interestingly if you look at time after PCI um so it's within the first year that uh, uh, kind of clearly differentiates all of these platforms. So the first newer generation drug eluting stents makes a significant impact within the first year. But as we heard uh from this previous speak Netherlands Robert van der Mush um so as we heard from the previous speaker I, i just want to make sure everybody can hear me i did, i i did hear some background noise i just wanted to make sure that you are hearing me okay uh, dr sivakumar i think you are speaking i can uh, but you are on mute please go, go ahead sir stripal sir you are well heard okay. sorry for the inter- interruption okay great uh, so as we can see here it's interesting that within the first 12 months i mean all the progress we have made seems to uh, play out in terms of uh, endpoints uh, for example reduction in uh, re- restenosis so we kind of have the newer generation platforms doing pretty well and as was elegantly shown in the prior talk 
you see this accumulation, uh, accrual of late events. And if you if you cover off the first 12 months and look at these three lines, I mean, they are pretty parallel. So in other words, uh, uh, we continue to have late accrual of uh, uh, events even after uh, a year after putting in a stent. And the same applies for stent thrombosis rates. Um, again, the, the newer platforms do pretty well. Uh, you kind of flatten the curve, but one thing to note is uh, even with the best available stents, there is a late accumulation of uh, failure rates. So, um, uh, you know, I joined a bit late. You may have seen some slides such as this or um, this particular slide. Looking at if you have patient with stent thrombosis, I mean, what are the typical causes? I mean, you uh, you heard uh, extensively from uh, the previous speaker as to what are the typical causes we think of in terms of uh, stent thrombosis. But if you do OCT, and I must point out that if there is any patient with a stent failure, it's very extremely important to do intravascular imaging to understand the mechanism of stent failure. But this is an interesting study, OCT findings, uh, looking at patients who had acute, subacute, late and very late stent thrombosis. And what I want to point out is, uh, let's focus on these uh, uh, colors, the red, blue, and this gray. So the red ones represent uncovered st uh, struts. The blue is malaposed uh, struts and uh, the gray is under expansion. You know, so we have control over all of these. And this is one of the reasons I want to emphasize on all three. So if you look at acute uh, stent thrombosis, the majority is covered by these three phenomenon, uncovered malopause struts under expansion. If you move to subacute, again, you see these three contributing to the majority of those uh, causes of uh, stent thrombosis. Even for late stent thrombosis, you see that over 50% uh, 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 cause is because of one of these three uh, phenomenon, which I must say is pretty much under our control. So if you're uh, doing a PCI today, we absolutely have to make sure that the stent is well opposed. There is no malopposition or under expansion. And this is one of the reason I wanna emphasize um, uh, these. And even for very late stent thrombosis, again, you see that uh, these three uh, contribute to uh, close to 40% of the cause for uh, stent thrombosis. And if you look at the dominant findings identified by OCT in very late stent thrombosis, according to the type of stents, and uh, you know, let's just focus on um, um, uh, the second generation DES. Um, again, you see that if you look at uncovered st struts, malopause struts under expansion, uh, for second generation DES, again, this contributes to uh, the vast majority of uh, the causes for uh, stent thrombosis. And the reason I want to emphasize this is um, what we do today uh, does matter in terms of uh, reducing the risk of uh, very late, uh, late and very late failures. And it's critically, critically important. And we'll look at some of the data again. What about uh, second generation DES restenosis? Again, you heard a lot about this in the prior talk, but uh, again, to just to emphasize and also to keep it simple, it really depends on whether the restenosis occurs within the first year or after first year. If it is within the first year, the dominant reason is uh, under expansion. Um, and if it is beyond one year with the newer generation stents, the dominant mechanism is neointimal hyperplasia. So if it is within first year, if your stent is failing, there is restenosis, it's likely because of some technical issues under expansion. If it is beyond one year, uh, it, it, although uh, under expansion does play a role, uh, the dominant mechanism is potentially uh, neointimal hyperplasia. And you heard that uh, drug eluding stents uh, does uh, promote uh, neoatherosclerosis. So in other words, there is a faster neoatherosclerosis with uh, drug eluding stents based on the mechanism of action. So the common theme so far we have heard so far is technical issues does contribute to uh, stent failures. And uh, so if you have a patient today with stent failure, either stent thrombosis or uh, restenosis, can I just take some pictures? Can I just do angiography and figure out what is the mechanism of uh, uh, failure? For example, this is a study looking at mechanism of stent thrombosis. So if you were to purely do coronary angiography alone, uh, you can only identify complete um, uh, the mechanism of stent thrombosis in only 12% of patients. If you were to do an OCT in these patients, uh, so you can uh, identify uh, completely the mechanism of failure in close to half of those uh, patients, 43% of uh, patients. So you'll, uh, by doing some kind of imaging, you increase the proportion where you can actually identify a cause 
And of course, if you look at uh, unidentified cost, it's significantly lower and probably identified cost uh, significant um, higher. And with OCT, you can see that uh, in uh, nearly 22% of patients, you can identify multiple uh, abnormalities as the cause of uh, stent thrombosis. But again, we'll discuss later why this is very important because if, if, if there is failure and you do exactly the same thing as you did the first time around, you're not fixing the problem. So I think this is critically important. So you have to understand why is this stent failing? We'll go over some of the OCT and uh, how this is important in guiding uh, what we do in the cath lab, how to fix these uh, issues. What about um, ISR? Uh, again, I won't go through much about this. Uh, you heard a lot about early ISR, late ISR, and intravascular imaging, your OCT, can actually provide interesting insight into why there is uh, instant restenosis. For example, when you compare early versus late, um, uh, early ISR has greater proportion of homogeneous uh, media, whereas late ISR, there is more preponderance of uh, lipid laden uh, uh, plaque and also neoatherosclerosis. So it's important to understand that the treatment uh, may actually uh, be different. So um, as I've been uh, pointing out, I mean, so the first part of this is that we're just focusing on how can we prevent this? Um, so I want to emphasize this trial. So we know that Evrolimus saluting stents, I mean, if you look at some of the data, it's one of the best uh, available stents we have, significant uh, lower uh, stent failure rates compared to older generation stents, uh, et cetera. So uh, this is a randomized trial, the IVUS XPL uh, trial um, uh, in patients who had long coronary lesions, so implanting stents which are 28 millimeters or longer. Patients were randomized to DS implantation with IVUS guidance versus angiographic guidance. I'm just showing one example. There are a number of uh, trials here. And the, uh, the clinical follow-up, the primary endpoint was MACE at 12 uh, months. And so interestingly, in this uh, trial, if you look at IVUS guidance versus angiographic guidance in all patients who are undergoing uh, Everolimus eluding stent, you see that adjunct post-dilatation was seen in 76% if you do IVUS guidance. And if it is angiography uh, guidance, only 57% of them underwent uh, uh, post-dilatation. And of course, if you look at other parameters, the MLD was uh, definitely larger with IVUS guidance. The person diameter stenosis was, uh, 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 the residual diameter stenosis was uh, lower in IVUS guidance when compared to uh, angiographic guidance. But the question has always been, uh, you know, does this make a difference? Um, would we see a difference in uh, endpoints? And of course, in this trial, there were significant uh, lower MACE rates. And, you know, you heard from the previous speaker about the failure rates and like, uh, uh, you know, close to 5% the first year. But look what happens when you do IVUS guidance and specifically in a lo long lesions. I mean, we, have, we know from first generation uh, era that the longer the stents, the, the risk of uh, adverse stent related outcomes is significantly higher. But if you do IVUS guidance, the MACE is 2.9%. Um, and of course, most of it is driven by ischemia driven TLR, 2.5%, as opposed to what you heard uh, before, the failure rates of around 5% uh, with angiography uh, guided PCI. So in other words, you can cut the rate of stent failure by half by uh, doing uh, what needs to be done, optimizing your PCI upfront. Um, you know, I also, uh, there is this uh, notion, uh, people have asked me, oh, why can't we just do post dilatation on every patient? I mean, uh, maybe with, uh, I don't want to use IVUS. I don't want to spend time using IVUS. Why, just, why don't we just post dilate every uh, lesion and maybe that's good enough? And this is an interesting uh, data, kind of uh, will uh, address the issue. So this is a pooled analysis of uh, two randomized trials, IVUS XPL and uh, RESET uh, long trials where they categorized uh, PCIs as uh, where there was adjunct ballooning. So there was post dilatation versus no post, post dilatation. And as you see here, uh, if you look at the uh, uh, signal here for MACE, uh, even in a match population, you see that it really, uh, the just ballooning post dilatation does not get around and uh, does not reduce your events as much as IVUS does. And the reason I want to uh, say is I want to uh, leave you with these two points in terms of uh, imaging guided PCI versus post dilatation. So if you say I'm going to post dilate every stent I'm going to put, yeah, one has to understand that just post dilating a well expanded and well opposed stent will not be beneficial. So you'll be just post dilating, but likely won't be beneficial. Uh, but if you're post dilating a malopposed stent uh, using inadequately sized balloon, 
this will also not fix the problem. And that's one of the reason just by saying, I'm going to use a post dilatation balloon and, uh, you know, deploy it to 16 to 18 atmospheres, and I can get away without using IVIS may not be the right strategy because you may not be using the right size. You may not be do uh, doing the post dilatation to uh, uh, stents that actually need it. Okay. So, um, why is intravascular imaging important? It can actually potentially guide what you're going to do. For example, if you look at instant read stenosis, there are uh, multiple different uh, morphological features of uh, instant read stenosis. For example, here is an OCT of, uh, you clearly see the strength struts here, and you see instant read stenosis, and you see a chunk of calcium here. So this is a calcific instant read stenosis. And of course, if I were to approach this, I would just not um, uh, use my typical balloons, Maybe I'll be more likely to use an NC balloon, a scoring balloon, or a cutting balloon. And uh, even uh, orbital rotational atherectomy kind of devices, IVL, and even a laser. I'll show some cases uh, we did with the laser. Um, but if you have calcific ISR, you follow a pathway. If you have, uh, if you do an I, uh, uh, OCT, so here you see stent struts and a thick layer of fibrotic ISR. In this case, do you really need atherectomy? Maybe a laser atherectomy uh, is helpful, but uh, typically an NC balloon scoring or a cutting balloon is more uh, useful. But if you do an OCT and find a lot of lipid core, um, you can uh, pretty much get away with an NC balloon scoring or cutting balloon. But the key for me is this concept. I mean, uh, we have seen a number of patients with ISR where the stent is very underexpanded. And of course, when you see this, you know that this is not a neo-intimal uh, uh, hyperplasia issue. It's more under expansion and we really need to optimize it. The worst you can do is to assume that uh, uh, it is any other cause of um, uh, ISR and putting a second layer in. So if you put a second layer in and it's still ex uh, under expanded, your risk of free stenosis is significantly higher. So in these cases, uh, you can consider uh, laser atherectomy. Um, I'll, I'll show you some uh, data, rotational atherectomy, NC balloon, or even uh, lithotripsy. So uh, let's look at a couple of uh, examples. Um, so this is a 71 year old uh, uh, patient with the heart failure presented with an NSTEMI. And this is six months prior, the patient had a, a DS to mid LAD. Uh, sorry, this should mean uh, mid RCA. So there is a stent placed right here. So this was placed as an outside hospital six months ago. I mean, looks okay. Um, and geographically, there was no uh, intravascular imaging uh, data available. But now this patient comes in with, uh, um, now uh, there is an instant stenosis right here. Okay, so previously, uh, this was the uh, deployed stent here, which, uh, you know, angiographically does not look all that bad. It's at the bend of RCA and now, uh, now they have uh, ISR. So in this case, um, uh, we did an intravascular uh, uh, imaging. Uh, I think he had some CKD, so uh, I did an IVUS. What we found was there was a segment of the stent which was uh, under-expanded. So here we started with the 3O NC balloon, went up to 22, and you can see that the balloon is not expanded. Uh, so what we did uh, following this was to use a 0.9 laser uh, with contrast. So this is 8080 uh, contrast with, uh, 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 this is a contrast uh, laser here for that particular spot. And now then we took a 3.5 NC balloon and went up to 22 atmospheres. And you can see nicely uh, uh, this, uh, the balloon clearly uh, expands. And uh, then uh, we put in a 4-0 stent and for post dilated to a 4-5. And so this is very uh, important to re recognize uh, that, uh, you know, there was a stent which was under expanded, which was not very obvious on uh, angiography. And this is one of the reason why uh, optimizing PCI first time around is uh, critically important. And this has been like uh, two years, uh, uh, two years ago, and the patient is still doing uh, pretty well. Um, another patient, this is a 74-year-old guy with uh, recurrent uh, ISR. Um, again, you can see that here, uh, he has uh, two layers of stents already, and he came in with the uh, recurrent uh, ISR. And again, when you uh, do um, uh, any of your stent boost, et cetera, or do an intervascular imaging, you, you can see that there is a uh, part of the stent which is uh, under-expanded. 
In this case, uh, we again took a, a, a 0.9 laser radiated contrast. But what I wanna show you here is what happens when you do a contrast laser. You just have to be very careful when doing that uh, to avoid macro bubble formation. So here you can see some bubbles. Um, I mean, the, the key thing to avoid here is to actually go much, much more slower than what we did here. Uh, but if you do slowly within a stent, a contrast laser is pretty good uh, to help uh, expand. And again, these were the times uh, we did not have uh, lithotripsy. I mean, uh, right now, again, we still don't have uh, lithotripsy approved for coronary indications, uh, but uh, th this would have been a good case uh, even for uh, uh, lithoplasty. Um, what about... Um, uh, so another patient, 57-year-old female, Takayasu's art arteritis with uh, chest pain and NSTEMI. Uh, she, uh, previously, she had prior PCI of the CTO of an LAD and came back with uh, restenosis. And in her case, I mean, the stent actually looked uh, well opposed. And in this case, we, uh, we wanted to do a more of a uh, ablate some of the neoatherosclerosis. When we did an intravascular imaging, we found that the expansion was not the issue, it was more of a neoatherosclerosis. So we took a 1.4 uh, uh, laser 6040, of course, without contrast, because we are only trying to do a tissue ablation and not really um, um, uh, trying to expand an under-expanded stent, followed this with a cutting balloon 303540NC. And in, in fact, in this particular patient, we used a drug-coded uh, balloon. And of course, uh, in, in the US, currently there is no coronary drug-coded balloon uh, approved. This is a peripheral drug-coded balloon that we used uh, off-label in this particular case. And it, she, she did uh, pretty well after this uh, procedure. Um, so let's see. So another case with the 64-year-old male chest pain and NSTEMI prior CTO of uh, uh, LAD. And uh, this patient, uh, you can see uh, the, the distal targets are pretty poor and so he was deemed not to be a surgical candidate. And uh, here again, we did a, a 0.9 laser uh, for the LAD and this is the final results. Um, uh, again, uh, understanding the mechanism, and in, in the last two cases, it was not really uh, under expansion, but more of uh, uh, neointimal proliferation. Uh, what about drug coated balloon for ISR? And as I pointed out, in the US, we don't have uh, coronary drug eluting balloons. So we have peripheral drug coated balloons. And of course, we can only do it uh, uh, for appropriate size patients. Um, this is an interesting example of a patient, 65-year-old female, unstable angina. In 2007, she had a drug eluting stent to mid-LAD, which is a first-generation drug eluting stent. 2011, came with ISR and uh, uh, at an outside facility, she had a second-generation drug eluting stent uh, placed to the mid-LAD. Three years later, she had progression of the proximal and distal disease of the LAD. So they, uh, uh, at an outside of hospital, they expanded the the stents, so now she has a proximal uh, extension and a distal extension of the of a DES. And 2017, again, presented with the unstable angina. And when we saw her, you can see that she has a, almost a full metal jacket. Now she has a ISR and a, a occlusion of her stents. And so we didn't want to um, um, you know, put in more layers of metal. So in our case, uh, we opened up the CTO and uh, aggressively dilated uh, with an NC balloon. Um, I did an uh, IVUS to understand the mechanism of stent failure and ended with a, a 4 by 40 a drug eluding balloon. I can tell you that this patient uh, used to present uh, to our hospital every few months. Um, and since we did this, I mean, this has been now uh, three years and she's been doing uh, pretty okay. Um, in, in our case, what we did was uh, we discharged her not only in dual antiplatelet therapy, but also in celastazole. So I just want to uh, quickly summarize uh, what we do. So we do, if you do get patients with the uh, restenosis, we have been uh, routinely using uh, celastazole in, in, in addition to uh, dual antiplatelet therapy. And, uh, you know, we published this data many years ago, looking at celastazole plus DAPT versus DAPT alone from randomized trials. And what we showed was uh, celastazole does a twofer. So in other words, it uh, makes the platelet uh, reactivity better. So there is a 60% uh, decrease in clopidogrel resi resistance, but also reduces endpoint. So uh, there is a 32% decrease in maize, restenosis, and also stent thrombosis. Um, uh, the only flip side is there is an increase in drug discontinuation due to uh, adverse effects. Most common adverse effect is uh, headache and palpitation. Uh, the mechanism of action of celastazole, it not only has uh, antiplatelet activity, but also inhibits neointimal hyperplasia and smooth muscle proliferation. So this is important to recognize more so because um, 
you know, I've heard people say, oh, I'm going to use a more potent antiplatelet to prevent restenosis. It's important to recognize that's not going to prevent restenosis. The only reason celastazole does is because it inhibits uh, neointimal hyperplasia. The dosage is 100 milligram BID, and it's contraindicated in patients with uh, liver failure. I know we are running out of time, but uh, just to uh, discuss about drug-coated balloons, which is new generation DES for ISR, there have been uh, five trials, but again, it's a, not a lot of patients, 913 patients um, trying to figure out if you have an ISR, uh, should, we put it, should you be just using a drug-coated balloon versus a new generation DES? And of course, uh, DES, if you implant a new DES, uh, there were um, better acute um, again, so higher acute gain, lower person diameter stenosis at the time of the procedure. And of course, in this meta-analysis, there was a 49% decrease in TLR. But if you look at all other endpoints, MACE, cardiac death, MI, stent thrombosis, binary stenosis, or a late lumen loss, it, it actually was no different between uh, recorded balloons versus uh, newer generation DES. So something to consider, I think we uh, it's important to individualize what we are going to do. So what is potential algorithm for instant stenosis. So if you have a bare metal stent uh, ISR, uh, you can consider a drug-coated balloon or a, a second-generation drug-eluting stents. If you have a drug-eluting uh, stent ISR, you can again consider a new uh, drug-eluting stent or a drug-coated balloon or consider brachytherapy. But if you have recurrent drug-eluting stent uh, ISR, brachytherapy or consider uh, cabbage in, uh, in such cases. And I want to leave uh, with this. If you have instant restenosis, critically important image because uh, what you do uh, after that really depends on what you see. Uh, and this is uh, critically important. To, so, to summarize, uh, stent failure is significantly lower with the second generation DES. But as you heard uh, from the previous speaker, uh, you, you, we continue to see late accu accumulation of uh, late failure rates. Prevention is key uh, by optimizing PCI upfront. And uh, once you have failure, understanding mechanism and phenotype of intravascular imaging is uh, very important so that you can tailor your uh, therapies. Uh, Drug-coated balloons or DS are effective for ISR and vascular uh, brachytherapy, if you have that option, can be considered if you have multiple layers of stents. Thank you for your attention. Eloquent and exhaustive talk, Dr. Sripal. We can't expect lesser than this from you. And uh, with, the short of, with the short time, I think we can have a five minutes discussion on this. We, I think everyone will agree here, uh, five to 10% of PCI is now happening in stent failure. And Stripal and Makesh have nicely exposed that there's a great scope for now, not only imaging, a recorded balloon, a laser, IVL, orbital arthrectomy, and whatnot. So quickly, uh, I will leave the talk to the expert panels, Dr. Stripal. Uh, Girish and Chandrasekhar Padil and I see Dr. Van Gun is still staying with us to quickly share their thought process before we move on to Jim. Uh, if I may ask. Girish. Yeah. Uh, yes, yes, Girish, go ahead. Yeah. So what do you advise Dr. Sripal? Uh, short of an imaging, what is the best way to implant a stent to reduce uh, stent failure? Yeah, so that's always a challenging uh, concept. What do you do if you cannot image? I mean, I do understand. I mean, I think, uh, you know, uh, in terms of equipment and cost and uh, everything does add up. Um, so, I, I, so I think it's critically important to make sure that uh, we prepare the lesion properly. So pre-dilate, give nitro, make sure the, your, the size is appropriate. And, um, you know, I always go back to uh, uh, the absorb days, the bioabsorbable scaffold, where we said, okay, uh, routinely you should dilate with a 0.5 millimeter greater post dilatation balloon. And, you know, we, in, in that, if you look at all of those trials in the Zion's arm, forget the absorb scaffold, in the Zion's arm, uh, there were five trials where the stent thrombosis at one year was zero. Why was it? Because once you advise the sites to do this, they did it in the Zion's arm and you have zero stent thrombosis in the, in the stent arm. So for me, pre-dilate, give nitro, adequately size, and make sure uh, if you cannot image 0.5 millimeter, at least a uh, uh, bigger post balloon. Thank you. Dr. Sahu? Uh, actually, the problem is when we have an acute ACS setting, when there is a lot of thrombus, we don't tend to uh, post-dilate much because of the slow flow and the complications that occur. So what is your strategy? Would you like to take the patient again after three to five days and again see if the thrombus is cleared again post-dilate? 
or do an OCT, what would be a strategy that you suggest to all the operators? Yeah, Most of so, the centers don't have uh, the same imaging. Yeah, so I, I think a critical input, you, you, your point is excellent. So I, uh, I rarely ever post dilated STEMI patients. So I can tell you, so STEMI, again, the same rules apply. You do whatever it wa you want, uh, thrombus aspiration uh, in a small size balloon, whatever to open the lesion, uh, give nitro, make sure you uh, adequately size. I have this running joke here. I generally ask my fellow, what do you think uh, the size, uh, uh, size of the stent we should take? Most of them will be like, oh, let's, uh, this artery may be 3015 uh, stent. And I go, uh, at least 0.5 higher. It always will be like 0.5 I, higher. So my rule is, if you think that the artery is 3.0, in a STEMI setting, I'd rather take a 3.5 and deploy to nominal than take a 3.0 and deploy to high pressure. So with that strategy, you know, I've never had um, slow flow uh, or a reflow. I mean, uh, I mean, rarely you do, but not as frequently as you post dilate. So I think that's critically important. Uh, to see if you can take a slightly uh, but, higher balloon, lower atmospheres. But do you Robert think that the patient should be brought into the lab once again after a week and see what's going on in an ACS setting? So yeah, that we don't it, have stent failures in future. Yeah, you know, so that's tricky. I mean, I, I you know, I rather do it once uh, because, as you know, if you bring the patient back again, I mean, there is a risk associated with the second procedure. Um, so typically, I tend not to do it, um, not to take them again for a relook. Re Dr. Robert, if you want to share instant failure. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, absolutely. I think it was an excellent presentation by Sri Paul on, on the mechanisms of instant failure and uh, the imaging uh, part in there was really absolutely absolutely important to understand uh, what you have to do to uh, to optimal treat uh, the, this process. And uh, we see the difference in um, late failure um, and we see more and more not only the new intima, uh, new intima formation, but mainly the new atherosclerosis, which are instant calcifications. And um, that's, I think, is, is going to be our percentage of stent failures is going to grow, but it will also grow in the patients with very late failure and new atherosclerosis. And these are the patients indeed where we, we need other therapies because in this case, you cannot just do it with a balloon and a high pressure balloon. If this has calcium inside the stent, it's very difficult. I usually talk like uh, a bit to the fellows and say what they want to do because I always think that if we have a, a late stent failure, we also have under expansion. It was very clear in your presentation. So the only thing which you really can contribute to make the old stand as large as possible, it is usually undersized. So we have to try to gain this 0.5 millimeter, which Freepal wants to avoid in the beginning. So you need to take a, a high pressure balloon and to make that as large as possible. So 30 atmospheres and be sure that you make it as intended original diameter and you absolutely will have the 0.5 one millimeter additional gain in these lesions um, because the stent was undersized. So imaging will help you. We will see under expansion and we need high pressure balloons or shock waves or other technologies to, to weigh more calcium and under expansion. I had one question. Uh, if the stent is under expanded during the first implantation in ACS, you realize it the following day uh, um, maybe, you know, a uh, lot of thrombus. When is the time you call back to expand or you just leave it and wait because the restenous mace is only 40%. So what would you do? Who are you asking? <laughs> <laughs> no. We would anyway expand, but how soon? I mean, if there's a lot of thrombus, it may be a uh, slow flow. Are you still going? No. It you know, it happens in our hospital as well, I would say. Of course, not always or luckily if hardly any times, but we have huge discussions and I think we had had discussions before, either from study patients who came up from their study OCT for the STEMI patients. The only thing is that we hardly know, um, you know, we have seen a lot of malposition at baseline, 200 microns, 300 microns. We are sure that that will be all embedded. 
uh, you're not going to reduce the risk a lot. Acute malposition, uh, also Gary Mintz was very clear about that, doesn't have a real impact on long-term outcomes. So we really have on, on stent thrombosis. We have to be really careful if you look at the prospective data or the retrospective data. We have seen the retrospective data. They point out because you only look at the patients who had the trouble, but you can't find a lot of differences in a fresh implanted stent besides malposition. You know, that's the only thing which you can see uh, hardly in these patients. So, um, go back usually and try to correct any malposition which is less than 200 microns is useless. We know that. that that's really important. So, if you are over more than one millimeter wrong, I'm even not sure if a second procedure or a second risk going underneath the stents with your wire create even more deformed stents. Is that going to help? I think I would go for be sure that you have the best, best antiplated therapy uh, for these patients. That's my yeah. personal opinion. I think we have time to move on to uh, gym session. Uh, sorry, Dr. Robert, to intervene. One quick comment from Dr. Santar Sekarvi Patil. I see Dr. Hiramat and Dr. Antonio Colombi here, Dr. Ajit also here. I welcome you all of you three, sir. One quick comment from Dr. Chandra Sekarvi Patil about stent failure and with, with respect to both speakers. Whenever there is a predominant uh, neurointimal hyperplasia as the main mechanism of the stent failure, should uh, in all these patients should we uh, use scoring balloon or cutting balloon or only a non-compliant balloon because many a times at the end of the uh, procedure if you are putting a second dash always there will be a layer of uh, previous neurointimal hyperplasia in many of these patients so uh, whether it's a good idea uh, to use scoring uh, balloon or a, some kind of a scoring balloon or cutting balloon in each and every patient or should we direct only with a non-compliant balloon yeah, yeah so that's I think fantastic. That's Let me conclude the session by saying preparation is the key and this stent failure is going to happen quite often because uh, we know that reasons behind and we know uh, there are a lot of tools now available. One should get equipped with all these tools to tackle them better, not to have more re-intervention rate. Thank you very much, Dr. Makesh, Dr. Sripal for those wonderful talks. A big thanks to panel here, Dr. Sahu, Dr. Girish, and Dr. Chandra Sekhar V. Patil. It was indeed a wonderful discussion and lots of learning. Now it's time to move our key session for the evening. So this is the first time happening in the history of uh, webinars that we are combining with Jim, the Joint Intervention Meeting 2021, and a sponsoring session where we shall be having a live case and two talks focused on bifurcation. The session is focused on bifurcation. We shall be having a live case done by Dr. Samuel Matthew from Chennai Apollo, followed by Dr. G. Sengativelu and Dr. Deepak Devishan shall be delivering talks on side branch closure and unplanned bifurcation in ACS scenario. Dr. Antonio Colombo from Milan, Italy, and Dr. Asib Ladi from New York, USA, and Dr. Ajit Mulasari from Triple M Hospital, Chennai, Dr. Arun Kalyana Sundaram from ProMed, Chennai, and Dr. Hiramat from Pune shall be the panel members. I hand over the session to Jim 2021, Dr. Antonio Colombo. Hello, hi, good, uh, good evening to everybody and thank you for the introduction, Dr. Zivakumar. I'm very happy to be here uh, virtually, but with many Indian friends. Uh, I love the way you do interventions and uh, uh, we have uh, so many uh, tips and tricks in common. Uh, and it's so nice to share this, uh, this evening. I see Azim that he's just joined. So uh, maybe I let Azim say a few words and then we go to Sam Matthew about the bifurcation life case. Thank you for the opportunity and thank you to all our colleagues in India for the invitation. We, we always enjoy these evenings we spend with you at Jim, um, cause we get to share all of our experiences together and we get to learn so much from each other. So we're looking forward to learning together um, during these live cases. And it's good to see you all again and you all look very healthy and well. Okay, is uh, Dr. Matthew connection uh, ready? If uh, 
We'll wait a few minutes. If he's not ready, I see some uh, yaya. Yeah. He's coming in. Can uh, we make it bigger? I see Apollo Chennai in uh, the screen. And here yeah. we are. I don't hear sound from them, though. Yeah, we need them. Let me mute my. Dr. Matthew, we see you, but we don't hear your voice. Yeah, we need someone to unmute Apollo Chennai, please. One of the organizers. Can you please check if he's mute? Can one of the hosts unmute them, please? Pratik. Uh, Dr. Matthew, can you hear us? Maybe just wave if you can hear us. We don't see you anymore. Okay, so they can hear us, which is great. We just need to unmute. We just need to unmute you because we cannot hear you. Okay. There we go. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, we had a surprise. Uh, the case which we wanted to uh, show to you live, unfortunately, became unstable, and we had to deal with that case. Uh, earlier today. We can start with that case for the first five or ten minutes and then move on to what we want to do now. Can I see the... Can I show... Can you show the picture, please? The patient... The first patient. Uh, hi, everyone. This is a hypertensive patient who came to us with recent onset of angina. His uh, angiography showed severe left main, calcified left main with a near total calcified LAD. He had stage 1 PCI where there was road ablation to the tight calcified PDA ostium. And the PDA and PLB were stented. Came back, used a cutting balloon on the osteolarsi and the osteolarsi was stented as well. We sent him back after stage one. He was stable at that point of time. And he came back this morning uh, with unstable angina, troponin positive, ongoing chest pain. We had no choice but to take him in. Um, the rest, the angio will speak for itself. His so, ejection fraction was about 63 days back. And he came in with 50 this morning. Image, next image, please. So you can see the right top corner was the RCA first check shot that was done. It was flowing well. The next image. So you. Okay. Can you um, make that image full screen? Uh, okay, that's fine. Can Perfect. you play it now? Perfect. Okay. This is the situation we were in. The proximal LED was. Um, Maybe 90, 95% uh, at the time when we left the patient with the right coronary angioplasty. Now you can see the LED is almost closing down. So we had no choice. Uh, we know from the dense ex extensive calcification that no microcatheter would cross. We have to do a, a wiring. 
with a rotablator wire because you, you yourself can see the dense calcium even looking at the screen. Next so time. that is a big challenge to use a rotablator wire to wire this lesion. Next. <coughs> you can see the calcification. We took a J, made a small J tip. Next. <coughs> Next. This is the bare rota wire. We got the nose into the lesion. Then things became a little more easier. Next. We advanced the rota wire all the way down. And we started with the 1.2 fiber. Next. That's a 1.2 fiber. Next. Then followed it up with a 1.5. Next. It's a decent cut. The flow is re-established, patient became stable. We have now time to think. Our decision was in favor of sending the distal or mid LAD first and leave the proximal part for when we are dealing with the bifurcation. The surprise we had was there is a dissection at the distal end of the area where we had done the rod ablation. So we have to seal that first, which we did with a 2.5 balloon, I mean 2.5, 23 stand. Proximal part was only balloon, we didn't put a stand there because we have to work on the circumflex which has got a, a tight lesion at the, at the ostium. Used a cutting balloon, 3.5. Next. And this is a 28 into 3.5, no, 4 stand. Four stand. We deployed that stent, did a port, next. That is looking decent. Now we have to rewire the LED, next, next. We have rewired the LED now and used a 2.5 balloon, NC balloon to post dilate the the stand. Next. <laughs> Subsequently, another two stands were put on the mid lady and proximal lady. Show the final. And gone. Next. Okay. The then this is the final standing. Five Next. Five balloon. Five balloon. Next. The, this is the final pictures. I wish we could have shown, shared this case live today, but unfortunately we couldn't do it. The patient which we did not want to show you live fell, back, fell on us and we had to start doing that case now. Can you go to today's case? This case, sorry. This case. Yeah. Go live. G go live, please. Okay. This is a 17, 70, what is the 79 year old lady. Post CABG had two graphs, SVG to OIM and uh, DEMA to LAD. Recent coronary syndrome. Hello. Hello. Then ECG again had significant EC changes, but EF was maintained. But the angiogram shows that all the graphs are cloned. 
And can I show the li live images, please? Next. 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 You can see the ostium is diseased. The whole LED is diffusely diseased and fully calcific. We know that this is going to be very, very difficult. First of all, wiring is going to be difficult. Then second is doing is going to be difficult. Next. We'll, uh, my, my, Andrew, show from here. Show, Andrew. Next. Next. Next, Andrew. This is where we are. We'll stop here. Any comments on the first patient, or do you want to go on to a second patient, or both? We'll do this. She's having ongoing Matthew, pain. Matthew, I think uh, the the case was very challenging, and congratulations for uh, uh, carrying in too. Nevertheless, uh, I have concerns that uh, uh, both tents uh, are still uh, underexpanded. I know, but I would have been more aggressive with lesion preparation. Uh, Antonio, because for the sake of time, I didn't show you, we have the OCT images here already, uh, which was well deployed. Okay, if you say that, uh, I trust. So can we see this picture? It's got chest pain and good one. We have the images before. Now, the, this patient has become very unstable. Can I interrupt uh, that case and go on to this now? Uh, yeah, let's go to the new case. Yeah. Give me 2,000 heparin. Give it to the next we, we, we knew we are going to be finding it going to be very, very difficult to wire this. We took a BMW wire. We are trying to wire the lesion. We managed to get the wire down. And we have a caravel microcatheter. It doesn't go beyond that junction. Go back, go back. Go back. Go back, what are you doing? And to you are on the spell. Excuse me. Okay. No, play that. Next. 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 We had a lot of difficulty in getting the wire across. Next. This is a caravel microcatheter. It doesn't go beyond that. Next. Now what next? Intubate. Do it. Do it, do it, intubate. Any suggestion what to do? Which wire are you using now? The, this is a BMW wire. No. Uh, maybe you have to try... This is a Whisper. Maybe you have to, uh, to try some hydrophilic wire. Yeah, this is a Whisper this extra is. support. The wire crosses, but the my, our, my problem is the microcatheter doesn't cross to exchange for a ro rota wire. At that junction where the tightest lesion, we are stuck. Uh, is the wire able to cross? Yes. Next. Yes. So maybe if the wire is able to cross, uh, you can uh, 
dilate proximally or maybe anchor with another balloon somewhere to get more support to cross with the caravan. Okay, what, what we decided was we would go, we'll try to get a, this wire, remove this wire and get a rotator wire through the microcatheter and see how well Maybe we can. The wire may cross, who knows? Yeah, that's what yeah. we try. Next. Next. If the caravel is full in front, may cross. This is where we were. Text. It doesn't cross. Next. The tightest portion, it doesn't cross. Next. We pull the, uh, my catheter out and this is the rotoblator wire. Okay. Floppy. Next. Okay. Next. 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 Anyway, we managed to get the rotoblator wire further yeah, down. Yeah. Good, congratulations. I think uh, we underestimate the potentiality of these rotor wire. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, now we took a 1.25 bar. Next. 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 You can see at this point she's uncomfortable. She's moving around. Yeah. This is a 1.25 bar. The bar wouldn't cut. And I can take a chance of uh, increasing the RPM or increasing the pressure. Then if I go past that, then the bar will get stuck. What choice next? Have you intubated? Yeah, I'm just doing it. I got it, I got it. I think maybe, Dr. Matthew, if you're worried about 125, try 1 1.5. I... Um, it's a very tight leash, and I thought 1.5 will be a little tricky to use here. And at that point of time, the flow completely stopped. Next. 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 Two minutes it won't cut. Next. It's almost three minutes of cutting time it wouldn't cut. Next. Okay. The flow, we took a 0.85 nano balloon and we managed to get across. Go up. Go up. Okay. Yes. Some flow has been reestablished. A uh, 1.85 nano balloon has crossed the region, and some flow has happened. This is where we are. <laughs> Amazing how severely calcified lesions you have. <clears throat> what is this? Now, what, this is a rotoblator wire. I, I have to decide whether I should continue with the rotoblator later or go and try only with the balloon. What is your suggestion? If so... I, I, think, uh, I think you may have uh, to continue with rotoblator. Take your time, uh, be slowly, uh, give some uh, uh, pressures, uh, take your time. Uh, let the flow recuperate, but uh, I don't see any other possibility, at least to make a small lumen. Um, but you have to take your time, uh, otherwise the patient will crash. Patient's already pressures are. Let's see what's happening. 
Try to be very uh, and gentle, give a base of pressures. Yeah. Want to take the balloon and open it? I think it's close. You take the balloon again. Yeah. You'll have to take the balloon again. So, Dr. Matthew, did the, did the Nick Nano actually cross the lesion itself? Yeah, it did. Yeah. Uh, would you consider then just, I mean, now that you got established flow and it looks like you can't sort of upsize the bird, would you consider just doing yeah. granuloplasty and then taking the next smallest bolt to kind of cross it? No, what? Okay. Okay. Just, just, the flap is just open. Just go back in again, sir. Put away. Put away. Just one sec, Arun. Just one sure. sec. Okay. Look, sir. What happened? I don't know. Small test? Yes. Small test? Okay, good. There, you can see it crossed. Go. You can see it crossed nicely, Arun. This is the nano balloon. Now what we'll do is, see, this is the rotablator wire. This is not the wire I would like to have across to deliver a bigger balloon. Get the micro catheter. Let me try whether I can get a micro catheter down at least now. But uh, why don't you rotablate uh, a little bit more? Now try the rota again. Intubated? Intubated. The BP is a little low because of the paralysis. So you just intubate it. Okay. One minute, I'll take the wire out. One minute. The pressure a bit low, Satish? Uh, yeah, pet pressure yeah. is low. Pressure is low. The vessel actually closed, uh, uh, Dr. Ajit. The, the minute we we have ballooned it now, we've got flow. You can see it's coming up. She's been quite unstable. She was actually unstable in the CCU. And uh, she dropped her pressures with chest pain, and we had to bring her down as an emergency. So this case was pretty much chosen for all of us. At this point of time, think of an intraotic balloon pump at least at this point yeah. of time. So what happened is that she had a angiogram done in an outside hospital with a, sued, with a huge pseudoaneurysm of the right side. And we just ultrasound that groin. Oh, no, sure. And I don't think we have the luxury of one more femoral axis. We actually had impella here and we didn't know. <coughs> don't move the light. We actually had the impella here, but we didn't know that we, don't have, we didn't have the second groin. But the balloon pump, you can place it from the brachial artery. Yeah. That's the last. <laughs> yeah. She's a 79-year-old lady. 81. Um, 80, 79, and uh, she is short. She is 5 feet. 4'8". Four eight. Four eight. blood pressure is better now. Blood pressure yeah. is yeah. better. The minute, the minute we open and the LAD flow comes back, in a little bit, the pressures come up as expected. Hold the wire. Yes. I've got the wire. Is it a new bird that you're going down with? If you have to give adrenaline or is spontaneous? She's already on supports. 10 of adrenaline, 10 of noradrenaline. Uh, oh. All right. What was the wire? I did. I would be a little concerned with this one. Yeah. With this sort of pressure. Not if we're open. Uh, 
again, even though the one small balloon didn't do anything much, it's not working. They're open. So, guys, one quick suggestion. Caravel and extremely calcified vessels is kind of not, I mean, you could try, uh, you know, if it's possible to use a bad extension catheter and a fine cross. See if it goes. What do you want me to do? Give me a two millimeter balloon. Maybe, Matthew, maybe you can dilate more proximally. Sometimes you break the plaque. Yeah, that's what I want to try. Uh, give me a two millimeter balloon. If you dilate proximally, okay. even with a 2.5, uh, you break the plaque and you can't. Can we are on a rota wire? Not always, uh, but. Uh, the, the only thing is, we are on a rota wire. It's okay. It's okay. We're, we're going to do it. In the old time, we used to do DCA on the rotor wire. <laughs> Antonio, you can do so many things which none of us can ever dream of doing. No, no, it's not true. It's not true. You are, you are a very experienced operator. Two twelve. You are going to. Very challenging. You get my. You have a work. Uh, 12, 12. Uh. Never see calcifications as uh, I see in India. Too negative. This is not what we wanted, but uh, it so happens that I need to tell the Italian friend for one month uh, to see what they really like coronary artery disease. Hold the wire, please. This is NC balloon, no? Yes, sir. The pressure is really catching up pretty well, huh? Eh? It's better. Should be an NC balloon, no? You know, the problem to do rot rotational arterectomy here, you give a lot of embolization. It's a double edged sword. Eh? What do you say? I, I didn't follow, uh, Antonio. So I say that the uh, rotational arterectomy is okay, but uh, gives embolization and is no good for the muscle. Yes. Okay. There go. Nice. Dilate there. Yeah, there we go. Maybe there we go. Forward flow. There we go. Walter. Oh, oh, look at that. Nice. Look at that. Look at that. Negative. Look at that. I'm, I'm so glad. <laughs> the, 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 uh, sometimes these proximal inflations uh, make it change no, no, distally. We, when we don't expect the balloon to cross, it crosses. <laughs> yeah. Look at the pressures. Sometimes it's good yeah. that you have no, no expectations. Fine. It's fine, ma. Don't. I like the rate. I'm happy with the rate. Negative. Not happy. She was an AF, she's now in sinus. Ready, sir? Ready. I'm putting stamps. There we go. Nice. That's great. Okay. Nice. Look at that. Congratulations. Okay. Thank you for the advice. <laughs> okay. Micro Microcatheter back. Micro you know, honestly. Honestly, I would not place any stents here. You will not place any stent? No stents, no stents. Huh? <laughs> Michael, get it. Uh, I will. I stents will. will be underexpanded. Don't place any stents. I'll just take this off. You, uh, how many of the uh, others agree with you? I don't know. <laughs> 
I know, nobody agrees. <laughs> I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised. <laughs> Just look at the pressures. Huh? She's back in sinus. The look, at is that. Gone. look at that. Yeah. You can send this patient home tomorrow morning. <laughs> <laughs> You're not going to stand, Dr. Matthew. You should do an FFR and then see that it's above point eight before you do no, that. No, at least at the level of the septal where we had the titus narrowing, the that is the area where I have a dissection. I would put a stand there and rest of the areas probably we can manage. Uh, Maybe only proximally, so, only proximally. Yeah. So no stent, 18 millimeter proximally, not too much. Uh, just, just a quick question for the panel. Would any, I mean, are you guys happy with the vessel? Would you want to do IVL? Do you want to image or see how much you're kind of, I mean, if you're going to, I think Dr. Colombo's point about putting an underexpanded stent is, I mean, that's that's a big problem, right? So we got to make sure the vessel's adequately prepped. Uh, now that we are in a good, stable situation, would you consider that? I think uh, I, mean, that... I am not very keen to do it because IVL produces so much of dissection. Uh, that tends to close much more than a balloon um, uh, balloon open lesion. IVL is not a very safe uh, device to leave without a stent. No, be before the stent, I mean, not just leave it as such, but before you stent, you got to prep the vessel, right? I mean, do we want to image yeah. it at this point? Or, I mean, we have a lot of options at this point. I mean, I think the worst hopefully is over and the patient is much more stable. <laughs> I'm holding it. Nice. Nice. Give me a BMW. Okay. <laughs> BMW. Yeah. You want a fresh one? Oh, no. In the freighter, distal wire, small turn. Test. Fire, sir, just do one. Would you just consider a long drug eluting balloon? No. Uh, I don't have any data on it. Uh, long drug eluting balloon. And any of you have the data? I, I don't know. But when you have so much calcification, Calcium. it doesn't work. Calcification, it doesn't work. The drug no, balloon no. may not uh, deliver no anything. I think Dr. Colombo's point of in a super calcified vessel, DEB might not be the optimal first choice. Yeah, I think uh, maybe okay. if you have some uh, nice okay. big dissection, okay. Uh, so give me a. We penetrate. Two and three, but, uh, but I don't see a lot of pictures? dissections. Copian balloon, two point five. I think a drug coated balloon may be a waste. My, my feeling is the question, Arun, you asked is that if you do an IVUS or something, what will happen? You'll see diffuse disease and then you'll yeah. be committed to doing a lot of things and you'll have a metal jacket. I, I will uh, place a stent proximally, short stent where there is a dissection. That's it. Yeah, I'll uh, see. We'll need a stent at the level of that uh, diagonal. There again, there is a dissection, there is a flap. Right. And that's it. How much ACT or something we should see? Do not overdo here. I don't know what that is. Can somebody give me an ACT syringe? Can I check the ACT, please? We lost. We lost your your. Okay, now you see. Okay. What balloon is this? Go quickly. Take the ACT. On two or two point five. Beautiful forward flow you have. On two or two point five. What is this? Two two and fifteen. OPN or. Uh... This is an NC track. This is the Abbott uh, NC balloon. Yeah. 
we can see there are a couple of flaps. There's one at the tightest point yep. at the bend and there's one in the proximal LAD. Deflator. I got that. Yeah. Go up. Negative. Huh? Oh. Negative. Would it be a good idea to take a guide liner and uh, over this balloon take it down? That would help us stand deployment to that area. Whether to take it down, we will make a decision now. We want to see the distal vessel properly. Pan it. Give me some nitro. See, if you look at the distal vessel, the whole vessel is diseased. Yep. There is no landing zone for a stent. I would like to avoid taking a stent beyond that diagonal branch. That would be the... Beyond that, I will leave it as it is. What do you all think? I will only place it in proximally. Only a short stent, 18 millimeter, trio proximally. But you need to dilate more proximally. Okay. Anyway. Okay. Matthew, I think this is a diffusely deceased vessel. I think uh, you would possibly use a short stent proximally, but if I use a stent, I will possibly I was that just to be sure it's well deployed. Otherwise, we don't land I up with that deployed stent. I agree with you, Ajit. Uh, See that flap? Yeah. Okay, negative. Okay, get a 2.25, uh, 18 cents. 18. Huh? Is yeah, or it is there. Right, yeah, you want to can take it. Cutter. Yeah, yeah, you can no, take no, it. I'm thinking about it. More if required. No need. She won't need. We're done now. We got flow. <laughs> Hi, mother. No, no, we don't need the ECMO now. <laughs> yeah, I have, I have both. Perfect. Yeah. Could this tent go to power? The balloon which we used was? Two balloons. We are taking shorter stands because we am doubtful whether the longer stands will track. Yeah. Negative. What size stands are you taking? This one is. Negative. 18. In size? 2.5. 2.25. Okay. I'll tell you, Papa. You can see the flap there. Death. Okay, go up. Sixteen, sir. We 
ஜீவன் I think DB or stent, you would have had the same end lumen area. Possibly, yes. But I am not experienced enough to comment on the DB. What are you doing with the mag? Why um, double mag? Andrew. What time are you doing? <laughs> See, the minute we fix that flap that was at the diagonal level, the pressures are picking up and she's behaving much better here. Yeah. Okay. Another 2.5. Yeah. 18, another 18. eight. 18. 18. Show the previous picture. Minus. Minus. Okay, freeze that. No, no. Previous. And do. Yes, okay, please that. Okay. Give, give, give. give. Yes, please. There's a lot of calcium there, the stand is getting caught. Okay, give me a guideline. Huh? Guideline. Huh? Guideline. Huh? Pressures are okay, we are open. Get the RCs, two units. Six.
லிவிங் வாழ சண்டை கூட சீக்கிரம் Matthew, I think you need to predilate with a trio yes, high pressure so. balloon. I think I have to predilate that area. Trio high pressure balloon. Get an OPN balloon. Give me an OPN balloon. Give me an OPN balloon. 2.5. Uh, 2.5 OPN balloon. Quick. Do you think it will go the OPN? Yeah, we're going to. The, uh, we'll use an OPN, I think. You have used it? Matthew, sir, Dr. Antonio says 3-0, or do you want 2.5-0? You decide. You, Matthew, you are the king. <laughs> <laughs> the magician. 3-0 we will do probably I think later. Proximal LED is 3-0. I never saw come, 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 come. Quick. Proximal LED is 2.5. <laughs> Here's a balloon. You, you prepare the interpreter. I got the balloon. What negative? Huh? Negative. Yeah, I have a, I have, I need a minute. It is okay. Let's open. No, a balloon, a syringe. Let me take. Negative. Yeah. Death. Go up. Samuel, are you thinking of advancing your guide liner before you withdraw the balloon? Uh, let me dilate uh, that segment better. Hey, Ramat, I'll do that. If I can do that, I'll try to do that. 25. Hey, 25, 30. 30. Negative. Go up, 30. Matthew, do you use OPN a lot? Yeah. Not too much. 30. Oh, why did you ask that? Negative. No, because, uh, no, we don't use too much. Uh, we use more rotational attachectomy, but uh, are they well, expensive? Uh, yeah. you, you use a lot or no? Not a lot, not a lot. Sometimes. Pretty sad. I think a good balloon, but uh, you have to be careful uh, because uh, they are very powerful. Go up. You need to undersize a little bit. I hope. I hope. Don't raise anything. Yeah, Dr. Colombo, this is 2.5, which I think is undersized for the vessel. Yeah, 2.5, you can take it at 38. We went up to about 35. 
Okay, he dilated. Come yeah. back with the balloon and dilate where yeah. the guy liner gets stuck. Dilate yeah. 4038 there. Take a picture. Oh, it's just a wire supply. Watch the wire. So, Dr. Colombo, guide liner and guide Zilla, uh, is there any difference in support? There's a name. One is liner. One Maybe is we can take the stand. Okay. I'll we'll take, take a stand, sir. We'll take the stand now. I'll listen to. I get the guy liner down a little bit more. I'll try. I'll listen to. Uh, I'll obey Antonia. I'll take a three balloon and uh, dilate the proximal energy. Yeah. <laughs> okay. You don't need an OPN. Take a regular high pressure. Uh, regular high pressure balloon. Three O and C balloon. <laughs> Yes. I'm getting the... <laughs> Take a three O and C balloon at 24 atmosphere. Get the NC track. Yeah. Dr. Matthew, the OPN balloon, what's the higher pressure that you use? You go beyond 40? We have done 40. Balloon? <laughs> He asked you what's the highest pressure we do with the opium balloon. We, I don't go more than 35, 30, 35. That is my preferred. Okay. 12. This is the real pressure. Go on, negative. Thanks, okay. mother. Okay. So don't worry. Connect. Go on. So give me the opinion in deflator. Give me the other in deflator. Twenty. Negative. AP cordon. Go up to oh, six, seven. Six. Epic Rainier. Negative. Put uh, inflate the balloon just uh, in so, over so. there. Inflate. Uh, cool. and, uh, and while you deflate the balloon, advance the guide liner. Yeah, you that's what I'm going to try. As a, as a sheet. Okay. 
Negative. As soon as we deflate the balloon, advance the guideline. Deflate and advance. There you okay. go. Okay, okay, that's the way to do. You see, the balloon is like a sheet. Yeah. This is very, very useful technique. Very often, I have found I like it very, very useful. Where the pressure is low again, sir? Oh, wow. That's just the guide to the end, or guideline around. Get the stand fast. Give me a 23. 2.7523. Fast. Are you good? No, it's fine. Because guideline is subtracting the. Yeah, go negative. Okay, go up. They give me another inflator. Negative. Beautifully expanding. In the inflator, rather. Give me another one. Take the guideline down, sir. I'll do that. Go up. Negative. You're doing a very nice job, Matthew. Congratulations. Very challenging case. I Thank you. I think the time is also running out. Yeah, but I think now it's just, uh, it's just routine. It's just routine. Only inflation, one more stand, I think. Yeah, now Beautiful. it's routine. Inflation, deflation, inflation, deflation. Nothing much. All the flow is good. Okay, uh, maybe anyway, we'll thank you to... so much uh, uh, yeah. having us live. Yeah, thank you for this interesting case. We always learn uh, a lot. I tell you, solving problems uh, with the help of each other makes me learn and uh, you learn. We still have time to grow. Okay, thank you so much. Good, okay. good night. Bye -bye. Take care Bye -bye. and good Bye -bye. night. You're almost ready to go to sleep. <laughs> Come. Great job, guys. Good night. Wonderful Good night. job. I think we have a lecture now. Walter? Can, uh, can we go to the lecture? The leg, the leg Mechanism of side branch closure. Yes. By Dr. Sengo Tubelu. Can I? Yeah, okay, sure. okay, okay, okay.
So I share my screen. Yeah. Submit the subflow. My sure. guideline, is, guideline is not a language. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yeah, we can see your screen. Please, uh, uh, can you mute uh, Dr. Matthew Laboratory because we need uh, to listen to the lecture. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can, we can hear and we can see you. Yeah. Thank you, Chairman and uh, Colombo. I'm very happy to present this and, and be happy to be in this meeting. So side plants closure, the mechanism and prevention. So we all know the strategy to treat bifurcation lesions uh, is become complex and sometimes difficult. And uh, side branch occlusion can occur up to 9% of bifurcation PCI, despite using the conventional jailed wire technique. And also the side branch occlusion increases stent thrombosis by six-fold and cardiac death by four-fold. So we know that uh, the relevant side branch is identified by not only by the length and the size, but also uh, the length of 270 millimeter identifies a significant uh, side branch, uh, which is uh, up to 10% of the fractional myocardial mass. So the length of the side branch also matters along with the size and the territory supplied and the collaterals. And the extent of plaque morphology, the calcium, and particularly when there is a large plaque burden, like in a true bifurcation lesion, uh, it is significant and the lesion length more than nine millimeter is an independent predictor of maze. So there are several predictors of side branch compromise, as I just mentioned. So if it is a 1-1-1 one, one, one bifurcation with a disease at the proximal main branch, side branch ostium, with a long lesion extending to the side branch ostium, it's one of the predictors of uh, side branch compromise. Uh, this is a resolved score system where they identified six major predictors of side branch occlusion, a block distribution, a tiny flow before stenting, procedural diameter stenosis of the bifurcation core area, the bifurcation angle and the diameter between the main branch and the side branch and the diameter stenosis of the side branch before stenting. Also, OCT has given us uh, several other predictors, particularly the carina tip angle. The length of the carina, that's the spiky carina, is a predictor of side branch closure. If there is extensive calcium in the bifurcation core area, that is also a predictor of side branch uh, closure. So let's understand the mechanisms of side branch closure. We all know one of the major causes of side branch closure is plug shifting, the carina shift, or it could be just the prolapse of the stent struts into the branch, or it could be spasm of the side branch, or it could be dissection caused by the balloon. Usually, it is a combination of both plug shifting as well as the carina shifting. So let us learn about plug shifting. Here we have an example of a block in the main branch, just proximal to the bifurcation, and the side branch ostium is patent. Once the stent is placed in the main branch, the block gets shifted to the side branch ostium. And if you look at the OCT, there is a large lipid block. You can see almost 180 degrees of lipid block, which is shifted to the side branch. And this is quite common when we find a block just proximal in the main branch, just proximal to the side branch ostium. So this is identified in this example. If you have, a, for example, in this case, you have left main to LED crossover stenting. After that, you see a pinching of the circumflex ostium. When we do an IVS, we can identify that the lumen area is significantly reduced, but the vessel area, the vessel area, that is the EEM, is the same before and after. The EEM is the same, whereas the lumen is compromised, which is clearly suggestive of arc shifting. What is Carina shift? Carina, we all know, it's the flow divider. And here in the exact example, you can see the LAD has got a lesion, a narrowing of the LAD and a wide diagonal. After stenting the LAD, we could see the Carina, the flow divider, shifts into the diagonal, and you have compromise of the diagonal. So typically, the Carina is spared from atherosclerosis due to, uh, due to high shear stress. Whereas if you have a large block burden opposite to the Carina, like when you stent, the carina can be pushed because of the block opposite to the carina. Also, if you choose a stent which is large, it can again cause the carina to shift and cause narrowing of the side branch. So 
So this is again identified in this example where by IVS you can see it's again a crossover stenting from left main to LED. There is a pinching of the ostium, pinching of the ostium or the circumflex. So you could see uh, post IVS the vessel diameter. There is the EEM is significantly reduced. The EEM 9.3 to 5.8. So whereas the lumen is almost same, but the vessel area vessel is reduced. Both the vessel and the lumen is reduced, which is suggestive of Karanar shift. Generally, a Karana shift causes less physiological significance as compared to a prog shifting. So how do you prevent? To prevent prog shift, it is important to prepare the lesion very well, and particularly calcified lesions, where vessel preparation is a key to prevent prog shifting. Whereas Karana shifting, uh, appropriate sizing of the stent as per the digital main vessel diameter, and the performance of proximal optimization, and final kissing balloon optimizes the Karana. So, how do we protect the side branch? Conventionally, we use a jailed wire technique. But as we know that jailed wire technique is not always protected and we lose a side branch in about 10% of the cases. So, adequate preparation is very important to prevent clock shifting. And if you have a very important side branch, start with, we can start with the side branch first with electric double stenting, where we ensure the side branch is protected. Some cases where we want provisional stenting, we can use enhanced protection of the side branch by using one of these techniques, particularly when there is a chance, high chance of losing the side branch after stenting or there is difficulty in accessing the side branch after stenting. One can use a jail balloon technique or a modified jail balloon technique described by Saito et al. and a jailed Corsair approach. The most important aspect initially is to make sure you wire the side branch and sometimes side branch wiring may be difficult. Generally try to wire, reshape the wire, a pullback technique or try using different wires, a softer wire such as field FC wire, use of micro catheter or dual lumen catheter or venture catheter. That most of the time helps to cross into the side branch. Uh, if or the different techniques now available described clearly going into the details. Uh, again, the reverse wire technique with double lumen catheter, a very elegant technique to wire difficult side branch or a venture catheter. Sometimes a balloon backstop technique, which is uh, placing a balloon and occluding the main branch just distal to the side branch and then trying to wire the side branch. Or as a last resort, one can try to do a rotablation or a calcified lesion or just to dilate the main vessel if you're not able to cross the side branch, just pre it, and that may help to uh, cross, uh, create more space to cross the side branch. Vessel preparation is the key, particularly in calcified lesions. As you can show in this illustration, if there is a calcified lesion, when you stent, the calcium doesn't allow the stent to expand in this region, and hence the carina gets shifted, and uh, there's compromise of the side branch. So it's very important to prepare the calcified lesions prior to uh, stenting. And in calcified bifurcation, there's been shown intravascular lithotripsy is effective, orbital atherectomy versus rotablation. Uh, orbital atherectomy has been shown to have shorter procedural time compared to rotational atherectomy. And in the pre-cal trial, it was shown rotablation was superior to cutting a scoring balloon. And uh, particularly, there is a less of plaque shifting with rotablation as compared to scoring or cutting balloon. But the challenges of rotablation ablation is uh, we can't use two wires, but there are people who have done this case. We're using a mother and child technique. Despite uh, multiple wires, they have done rotablation ablation using the mother and child technique. Enhanced side branch protection. Uh, this is uh, needed when you have an important side branch and you think uh, we anticipate difficulty after stenting to recross the side branch. In that case, you plan for enhanced side branch protection using one of these techniques, uh, which I'm going to describe in detail, the jail balloon technique. So jail balloon technique, uh, so it should be, uh, you should be protected, the side branch is protected with an inflated small balloon during main branch stent implantation. So a deflated balloon can be removed, retrieved easily from the side branch. As always, there is a fear that the side branch uh, balloon can get stuck inside jailing, yeah, but it can be safely removed after the main branch uh, stent deployment. So conventional uh, jail balloon technique is uh, where you place the balloon and the stent in the main branch. As you can see, the balloon is extending from the main branch into the side branch. This is a conventional uh, jail balloon technique. But the modified jail balloon technique is, again, uh, where you place the, uh, the balloon 
directly into the side branch. The proximal marker of the side branch balloon is at the ostium of the side branch. So uh, the modified jail balloon results in more uniform expansion and less acquisition of the main branch compared with the conventional jail balloon technique. So let's go step by step on how we perform a J J modified jail balloon technique. So wire both the main and the side branch and uh, place a stent in the main branch. Choose a stent balloon in the side branch with half the size of the stent in the main branch. So if you use a three millimeter stent in the main branch, use a 1.5 millimeter balloon in the side branch. Inflate both the main branch stent and the side branch balloon simultaneously. And uh, after that, you remove the main branch balloon and the side branch balloon. Usually the side branch balloon comes out without any uh, issue, it comes out easily. And then perform a pot and uh, perform a routine bifurcation stenting uh, with, a tap, with a tap technique and post dilatation as you like. I can show an example. Uh, this is a patient uh, where you have a left main and circumflex osteal lesion. So uh, this is uh, because circumflex is a, an important vessel here. You play a jail balloon technique is being done. Here you can see the balloon is placed in the circumflex ostium. The balloon is at the end of the circumflex. The stent is in the uh, LED. So both are simultaneously inflated, both the stent and the balloon. And after that, uh, both are, the balloons are removed. And, uh, and then the side branch is paid. And subsequently, the wires are crossed and uh, a tap technique where you place a stent in the, in the, in the circumflex. And uh, this is the final result. So next, moving to management of uh, side branch occlusion. So if, uh, uh, suppose you lose a side branch, despite uh, uh, these techniques like uh, jailed wire, then you have several options to bail out. And uh, the first step is to try and do another pot, a proper pot with a high pressure balloon, and uh, that might help in establishing the flow. If not, try to cross the side branch using hydrophilic wires or CTO wires, uh, maybe sometimes assisted uh, with a microcatheter. And finally, if uh, all these fail, then one can try to use a, a salvage uh, side branch technique, which I'm going to show it. So the pot uh, essentially uh, opens up the side branch, uh, access to the side branch and just improves the flow. And this is one of the case examples where you can see again, left main to LED stent and followed by the complete loss of flow in the circumflex. And then you perform a pot again and the pot uh, re-establishes the flow a little bit in the circumflex and then uh, we rewire and then a kissing balloon and this is the final result after stenting the circumflex. So if all the measures fail, even despite uh, we can try with the hydrophilic wire or with the assistance of a microcatheter, if you're not able to access a, a side branch and the side branch is closed, then finally you can think of using this uh, salvage technique where you try to pass through the jailed wire with a small balloon. And the technique is as follows. First, we place an inflated balloon in the main branch and then try to use a small balloon to the jailed side branch and then inflate the balloon. And once you inflate the balloon, you have access and there is flow re-established into the side branch and then perform a part and then do a conventional uh, stenting the side branch and establish the flow. So this is an example again. Here you have a, a 111 bifurcation lesion with a bi diagonal arising in an angle. You stent from the and then and across the diagonal. And after stenting, we lose the diagonal. And despite conventional methods, try to cross with a hydrophilic wire, we're not able to cross or access the diagonal. So the final option is to try and use a salvage where you place an uninflated balloon in the LED stent and try to cross with a balloon across the jail wire and then inflate the balloon and then perform once you re-establish the flow and then perform a kiss and this is the final result. So to conclude, side branch occlusion is not uncommon despite conventional jail wire technique. Block shift and kernel shift are the most common mechanisms for side branch compromise. Side branch wiring and jail wire technique works in most cases. However, we need to have these enhanced techniques in, in difficult cases, uh, such as jail balloon technique or side branch stenting first should be considered if an important side branch 
with the anticipated difficulty to access. In case of side branch occlusion, attempts should be made to recross the side branch, and if it fails, side, side branch can be rescued with a balloon through the jailed wire. Thank you for your patient listening. Uh, thank you, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sagotevulu. And uh, now we go to uh, the next lecture uh, by uh, Dr. Deepak Davidson, Approach to Complex Bifurcation Lesions in Acute Coronary Syndrome. Good evening to all of you. Uh, uh, first of all, let me thank the organizers for having given me the opportunity. I bring greetings to you all from the southernmost part of India, the God's own country. Uh, well, uh, I'll start with the case history of a 46-year-old gentleman who presented to us with recurrent rest and, den rest and dinner, and he was taken up for urgent revascularization. You could see in the first image that he's got a left main disease. He's got a circumflex osteal stenosis as well as a critical LED osteal stenosis. You could also see that there is a early diagonal or an ramus which has slow flow in it. You could also see in the spider view that there is a very critical stenosis at the bifurcation. And you could also probably see that there is a there is a tight stenosis of the ostium of an early diagonal branch. So we were more bothered about the diagonal branch too. Now our plan was to, our strategy was to do a DK crush technique to the left, left uh, LED uh, circumflex bifurcation and to have a provisional strategy for the diagonal uh, branch. Well, we started uh, uh, with the seven French guide catheter femoral approach. We dilated uh, LED as well as the circumflex branch. And then we decided to stent the circumflex with an expedition stent protruding a couple of millimeters into the left main. And that was um, uh, crushed following balloon dilatation. We removed the wire and balloon, and then it was crushed with a four millimeter balloon, the left main LED. And following that, you could see that we were able to achieve reasonable flow in all the branches. Now we try to wire into the circumflex um, artery through the proximal proximal cells. And you could see that the OCT reveals that uh, the wire has nearly gone, gone through the proximal cells into the side branch. We were also happy to see that the mouth of the diagonal was looking reasonably good. There was no significant plague at the mouth of the diagonal branch. So we were happy with that. And you could also see in this uh, longitudinal image that uh, the wire which has come from the left main, it has gone into the circumflex through the more proximal cells. And you could also see distinctly the mouth of the diagonal branch, which looks reasonably good based on the optical current tomography. Now we went ahead with uh, kissing balloon dilatation. Following kissing balloon dilatation, we were sure that we secured the mouth of the circumflex. So we took out the took, took the wire from the circumflex and we wired the diagonal branch. Once we wired the diagonal branch, we went ahead with stenting of the left main into LED. Once we stented, as you heard from Dr. Singo, we will just know that uh, you have the jail, jail balloon over there. It could see that there is a 1.5 millimeter balloon that was kept at the mouth of the diagonal branch, hoping that uh, the closure of this particular uh, branch could be prevented. And with the help of that balloon, the stent was deployed from the left main into LED. And for the proximal of optimization was done and once we did optimization we further uh, took uh, we further uh, recrossed into the into the uh, into the uh, circumflex and the, this time we tried to go through the more distal cells again we did an OCT run and made sure that you could see here that the wire has gone through the more distal cells into the side branch you could also see that the diagonal branch is looking good and following that uh, keeping the wire in the diagonal branch we did a uh, second kissing balloon dilatation and uh, prior to repot we made sure that the flow in the diagonal branch is good we removed the wire from the diagonal branch and then did a proximal optimization and finally we were able to achieve a good flow in all the three vessels the led the diagonal as well as the circumflex branch and you could also see that the ostia ostia of both the L, uh, diagonal as well as the circumflex looks good in the oct imaging now when i have a planned complex bifurcation in a patient with stable hemodynamics, I would always want to go step by step, keep the procedure simple. However, be meticulous, go step by step using a seven French guide catheter, probably radial or femoral, prepare the lesion very well. Try always doing imaging for these particular, these subset of patients because they're hemodynamically stable. Do physiology whenever it's necessary. Try to follow the basics, pot, kiss, and report. I would always prefer to use a DK crush strategy because the data is in favor of DK crush strategy than 
imaging post procedure for all bifurcation not to miss complications and finally keep the patients on dual antiplatelet therapy now for a patient with a plan unplanned complex bifurcation acs with stable hemodynamics always one should try to achieve the best results following all the steps now when you have a very unstable patient if the hemodynamics are bad what would you do still one should try to keep the procedure simple however whenever possible try to go through all the steps now secondly uh, a seven french guide catheter would be always preferable if possible through the femoral approach pro so that once or once in a while you could always have an intratic balloon pump also inserted through the femoral approach prepare the lesion well regarding image and physiology in a very sick patient in cardiogenic shock may not be always possible still always try to follow the basic spot kiss and report and uh, regarding the strategy of uh, stenting one should try to keep it very simple probably i would prefer a tap technique whenever possible in a, even in a complex bifurcation when the hemodynamics are very bad because the procedure time could be significantly less for the tap technique compared to dk crush and kilot technique and imaging whenever possible should be done and probably rather than clopidogrel one should think in terms of ticagrelor or presugrel and one should try to use second generation stents as well as mechanical support devices if the patient's hemodynamics are really bad looking at the data this was the data published in 2020 Uh, which says that um, uh, usage of clopidogrel and sirolimus elutic stents may predict increased mace in patients with unstable hemodynamics during acute coronary syndrome and that's the data from the dk crush 2 study which says that uh, even in patients with stemi uh, once you have a bifurcation a professional strategy or a dk crush stenting would be reasonably good for most of the patient but when you have a patient with unstable hemodynamics or when you have a patient with uh, uh, cardiogenic shock primarily we do not have any data regarding how one should manage a patient with a bifurcation stenosis now this is a uh, 41 year old gentleman who present with an atrial wall myocardial infarction in a nearby hospital multiple episodes of vtvf he was referred to us on the way he had multiple episodes of uh, cardiac arrest cpr was done he was straight away taken to the cath lab right coronary was flowing the left main was totally occluded right at the ostium we wired the left main did a thrombosection and following thrombosection uh, we could uh, achieve visible flow in the led as well as the circumflex branch you could see that there is it's a bifurcation stenosis the circumflex ostium looks significantly diseased however when you have a very sick patient do not go for a very complex strategy probably one should think in terms of a tap technique we stented the led having a wire inside the side branch you could see that there is a significant plaque shift into the circumflex ostium we try to do a balloon dilatation hoping that we may not uh, have to use a second stent however ultimately the the lesion remained there it was unyielding ultimately we had to go for a tap technique and that is a tap technique and finally we did a report also and following that we were able to achieve just timi 2 flow in all the vessels and the the branches were good but then the flow was significantly less the bp was very less we were wondering whether this particular patient is going to survive he had a cardiac arrest we had to while doing cpr while doing cpr we had to put in an ecmo for him 25 french venous sheet 21 in the arterial side that was done percutaneously and we started the impella you could see that the bifurcation is looking good however the flow is hardly timi too we know that there is hardly any myocardial um, any any micro micro uh, any perfusion of the microvasculature in this particular patient so since the hemodynamics was very bad we also put him on intratic balloon pump and was shifted to the icu pp tend to be on the lower side however on day 2 you could see that the uh, ventricle is hardly contracting however on day 4 we could be him off ventilator to see the multiple supports over there he developed hemodialysis uh, hemolysis he developed hemo- hemoglobinuria renal failure requiring crrt and finally after 8 days he was off ecmo you could see that lv was reasonable the blood pressure was good and uh, after weaning we were we were happy that we were able to shift him to the out of the icu to the room he was there in the room for another couple of weeks unfortunately he developed fever sepsis arrhythmias and he succumbed so when you have a patient with very unstable hemodynamics uh, probably one should think in terms of very, very simple stenting st- stenting strategy rather than going through multiple steps of dk crush or eculotic however when you have a patient with unstable hemodynamics if he stabilizes during the procedure probably one should revise your strategy for better outcomes this was a 43 year old gentleman who had a bypass surgery done a year ago all the grafts were occluded occluded he came with recurrent rest angina borderline hemo 
thermodynamics and he was immediately taken to the cath lab he wanted to have an intratic balloon pump however you could see that the right iliac system were reasonably bad so we wanted to do a very quick procedure our plan was to do a tap technique so we wired both the vessels and uh, we dilated both the vessels the flow was restored the hemodynamics were bad so we started him on inotropes inotropes however when we uh, when the flow was better the hemodynamics in improved so we decided to revise our strategy to dk crush hoping that the outcomes would be better than tap technique in this particular situation so we stented the circumflex it was crushed and following crushing we could could good could get to achieve a reasonable flow in the circumflex as well as led following that we tried to wire through the proximal cells you could see that we tried getting it through the proximal cells a high pressure balloon dilatation was done to led as well as circumflex and final kissing balloon dilatation was done following first kiss the hemodynamics were stable the flow in both the vessels were good we stented the left main to led proximal optimization was done and then we tried to go distal crossing into the into the into the side branch did an oct by this time patient was stable so we could do an oct we made out that the wire has gone through the more distal cells we were happy with that so finally the second kissing balloon dilatation proximal optimization and that was the final result and when we did the final oct you could see that the bifurcation was looking good the circumflex ostium was looking extremely well how we found out something abnormal we made out that the stent proximal end of the stent was deformed due to the guide catheter which can be better seen at the area where you see the arrow so we further went ahead and dilated the ostium of the stented segment and finally we were able to achieve good flow in that particular vessel now finally when you have a patient with unstable hemodynamics when simple strategy is not possible what would you do one only thing we have is to pray to god and do whatever is best possible this was an elderly gentleman who present with cardiogenic shock his bp was low pulled his heart rate was very low had complete heart block put on temporary pacemaker he was uh, intubated you could see that the left main bifurcation has got very critical stenosis and you could also see that the vessels are very heavily calcified in this spider view you could see that it's a very complex bifurcation a lesion extending more than 10 mm into the circumflex we tried doing rota with around 0.5 mm balloon nothing we were not able to cross it down size to 1.25 finally we were able to get the cuts properly done following that kissing uh, following that we did a dk crush technique to the bifurcation that's the uh, first kissing balloon dilatation following that extending from left main to led second kissing balloon dilatation and final optimization with a 5 mm balloon and that was the final result we were able to achieve reasonable flow in the circumflex left hand to descending artery and the patient was an intraocular balloon pump however his hemodynamics deteriorated his renal function deteriorated he developed acidosis and finally we lost this particular patient also now when you have a patient with complex bifurcation and active for patient to decide whether you need to do whether your patient is got a stable hemodynamics or unstable hemodynamics if it's got stable hemodynamics always try to do meticulously do all the steps to imaging and uh, find find final one should try to achieve the best possible results how is the patient is in shock probably one should think of a very quick procedure a very simple stenting strategy how to try to achieve best results so that the long term outcomes are good thank you so much thank you so much dr davison a very comprehensive uh, lecture unfortunately we went uh, over time uh, quite a lot uh, so we need uh, to conclude uh, this uh, symposium. I thank you all my Indian friends, very nice complex uh, procedures. I can only admire the work you do with such a complex anatomy, a difficult patient. I wish you good rest and uh, have a nice weekend for everybody. Bye bye, ciao. Thank you, Dr. Anthony Colombo, for staying with us such a long time in spite of crossing the time. And thanks for encouraging us and uh, keeping in touch with the Indian friends all the time and keeping us to move towards. Now you are in less metal, metal free stand. We'll try to follow that. Thank you, sir. And thanks okay. for accommodating us in gym session. You know, bye bye, bye bye. Take bye -bye. care. Uh, I just still see uh, Arun uh, Hiramad and Dr. Ajit and uh, having spent a good time with Dr. Sangatwilan, Deepak Davidson, let's evoke some discussion uh, about uh, Dr. Sangatwilan's talk uh, as well as uh, Deepak Davidson. Uh, to start with Dr. Hiramad, please. Yeah, about the uh, uh, protection of the side branch. Uh, I think uh, many of us are used to putting wire 
before we put a stent in the main branch. Uh, uh, once we put a wire and you lose the flow, uh, we try to go in with another wire through the stent. So that's the third wire. Uh, and uh, at, at this time, uh, many people uh, like to wire it uh, just mm -hmm. like that. So instead, if we take something like a caravel and go through the uh, side of the uh, of this uh, caravel catheter, uh, is that a better idea, or we like to? No, no, sort of... no, no. Thanks for bringing the point. So the first step is to try with the different hydrophilic wire. If you have, if you if you have already a jailed wire, you have stinted it. You are not able to. Uh, they got actually you have not able to cross then you can change try with the with a hydrophilic wire if that doesn't cross as you said you can try to use a microcatheter or sometimes a venture catheter to direct the wire into the side branch if all that fails then you you have to think of the other option like a, a salvage uh, uh, like what i described use a balloon through the jailed wire and try to open it up uh, what okay. size balloon you 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 start with Sangatwed? In that case, uh, working through jailed wire, to start with what size yeah. balloon? What do, the first step, than... no, no, the first step is to keep a uninflated balloon in the main branch, because once That's you go, put put a balloon there, you will not be able to enter into the main branch. So keep a uninflated balloon in the main branch, and then try with a small balloon, either Nick Nano or a low profile balloon. Uh, like Regin Plus or any low profile balloon with one millimeter, 1.5 millimeter, and uh, you try to enter. And uh, then you open it up, and once you get the flow, then you can recross and do a part, and you have a balloon already in the main branch. So that's a, lot. That's a great point. Keep a balloon in the main vessel because when you uh, unjail it, you may deflate the stand in a way that you may not go get into the main vessel again. I think that's very, very valid. In, an, in enthusiasm, don't jump into the jail wire. Keep a balloon over there. Uh, Dr. Ajit and Arun subsequently. I have become more and more conservative after doing many bifurcations. I just do two stents techniques in only left main LAD. Uh, circumflex with a big circumflex more than 2.5 or an LAD diagonal with a big diagonal. Otherwise, most of the time, I'm just treating the main vessel, in the OMs and the RCAs. Uh, I was using two stent techniques uh, before pre k crash, cool out. I found high resnosis rates, especially in the side branches. Whatever technique I used with whatever imaging I did, I still got about 25% to 30% resnosis in side branches. So I have now become more conservative. And unless it's a very big vessel, and I think that I need two stents right away to go through it to get a good, uh, you know, outcome. I don't do two stents. I just balloon, cutting balloon the side branch, stand the main vessel and try to optimize the main vessel. That's about it. I don't think it matters what you use, whether you use DK crush or pull out, whatever you are think, what you think you're good at and what your outcomes are good at. You have to image and get good pictures and see that your main stent is well deployed. That's fantastic, sir. That's kind of European kind of approach, even though Asians do a lot of they get a two stents technique. The Europeans still say a provisional is. I think the data also supports in that way. Dr. Arun? Uh, I think, first of all, congratulations. I think it's wonderfully organized. And uh, um, I mean, fantastic lectures, great live case. Um, I mean, I think Dr. Sengutuvelu's talk was absolutely masterful. I think he covered a lot of stuff. Um, I mean, the key thing, I just, just want to kind of re-emphasize, uh, don't make it more complex than it has to be. But sometimes, I mean, if you do decide you're going to, like, you know, the side branch is worth going after, perhaps you should plan it accordingly. Uh, but uh, I, I, I really like what Dr. Ajit just said, like, you know, try and keep it simple. If it's, if it's not a big enough amount of myocardium, don't, don't, don't go crazy. I mean, you know, you shouldn't be doing DK crush and this and that in small branches. Uh, I think imaging, everyone's kind of really stressed. It's, it's been great. I think Dr. Deepak Davidson showed a plethora of cases. Absolutely wonderful. Really enjoyed it. Uh, not a whole lot to add. I mean, it was, I think it was, it was a lot of fun watching, learning, and uh, congratulations, all of you. Yeah, having learned uh, side branch closure prevention, Deepak has shown good amount of cases in uh, ACS unplanned bifurcation scenario. Dr. Hiramath mm -hmm. would definitely would have a great real world cases. 
sir please uh, some uh, take home on unplanned bifurcation in a bifurcation in an ac scenario yes i think uh, the shift of thrombus is uh, probably very important in a acs situation and uh, i would always have a side branch uh, protected with a wire first before i uh, do anything so there will be two wires so uh, then you start working on the main branch Uh, put a stent in the main branch, uh, uh, do a pot, and then uh, come back for the side branch if uh, you need to do something. So here I would uh, definitely uh, focus on the angio images in multiple angles. And uh, if there is a slightest hesitancy in my mind that the side branch is not flowing well, I would uh, rewire and put a balloon there. Uh, uh, if balloon solves the problem, well and good. Otherwise, uh, probably end up with a tap. That's terrific. So, Dr. Sangatra, any time you are compelled to intervene in any ACS situation, uh, compelled to do a two stent technique. Yeah, I think uh, Dr. Sajid said uh, in an ACS situation, I want to keep it as simple as possible. Only in the left main situations, I want to put two stents. I think most of the time in LED diagonal. i have just managed to put one stent and try to get the diagonal flow even if there's a pinching or anything i just don't worry about it i think uh, i think deepak also mentioned uh, clearly that in in unstable patient don't try to do a complex stuff the message is very clear right thank you varandal i think we have moved from day 1 to day 2 sorry to hold on you all it was a great day 1 for high profile lectures to highly informative like cases we had close to four attendees even for deepak davidson case we had somewhere around 200 attendees to listen his cases i thank each and every faculty of today's session each one of you for your attendance and participation in today's program looking forward to see each one of you tomorrow at 6 pm unlike today 7 we, we are starting tomorrow at 6 pm for the approach for the management of acute coronary syndrome calcium in coronaries ectotic coronaries long diffuse disease and ctvo i'm sure tomorrow would be another exciting day till then stay safe in a waning pandemic let's get vaccinated and keep staying safe thank you varandal let me see you tomorrow thank, thank you, you bro bye shiva bye bye shiva bye can i can i guys bye thanks